afternoon. Um, Steve and Ian and I sat down and talked about um, what we might do today to sort of try and coalesce some of the thoughts, which were quite, <laughs> quite far-reaching yesterday that we had our discussion. I thought the discussion yesterday was very good, uh, both the morning and afternoon discussions that helping us sort of winnow down uh, what we're looking at and how we're going to be looking at it. Um, we had a number of, of suggestions from folks about some alternative uh, metrics uh, and procedures to be looking at in this thing. And so overnight, Steve did some work on, it's a federal employee. <laughs> Welcome, Lo. <laughs> anyway, welcome, Lo. Uh, so last night, Steve did some work on trying to look at um, using the reference points in a somewhat different way as well as looking at a, a, a catch floor and stuff. So I'm going to have him uh, go through that for you this morning, uh, first thing. And then I'd like to come back and talk about uh, what, how we might start going about developing alternative harvest policies because I think we've been rambling a little bit about uh, how we should, what's the next step forward in this kind of thing. So I have some suggestions about how we do this and basically I think we should be starting from where we are and trying to do some modifications on that and go that route as opposed to trying to build something de novo right off the, off the bat on things. So um, Steve, do you want to go through what you went through last night, please? Sure. As soon as I get control of the screen. There we go. Turn off my email. So um, for those of you following along on the, the uh, website, Jay, as of 30 seconds ago, put in all the updates. Um, and he's probably still in his pajamas at home, too. I hope he's not listening. Uh, what I did last night is we had a, a long discussion last yesterday afternoon about the reference points, and I think we all agreed that this biomass conservation uh, of 30% depletion, 20% depletion were two key numbers. So I stuck with the, the harvest control rule that adjusts the fishing mortality rate downwards uh, when the biomass hits 30% and then shuts the fishery down. Um, at 20%. So just to reiterate, we had these two scenarios about recruitment dynamics from yesterday where we have a deterministic model and a uh, model that allows for recruitment to change over time. I'm going to just show you the corresponding catches that came out of that 30-20 rule. And one of the things we noticed that we didn't like is there's many occasions where the fishery is closed for one year or even on a few occasions multiple years, but there's a high probability of closing the fishery if, in fact, this PDO hypothesis about recruitment dynamics is true. So the notion, I think Dan first suggested it, we won't call it the Dan procedure, but... Um, the notion is is that we really don't want to do this. I think objective four is we wanted to keep some sort of fishing going, and the, the sable fish industry said, hey, listen, we can live with a minimum of 2,000 pounds, provided that we you know, have some chance of rebuilding the stock over a certain time frame. So what I did then is I just added another harvest control rule that has this uh, name 3020 floor. And what the floor means is that there's a minimum catch. So you're either going to harvest based on whatever the harvest control rule says, or if the harvest control rule says shut the fishery down, we're actually not going to shut the fishery down. We're going to catch 90 units of fish. So 90 units is right down here just below 100. So the minimum catch is going to show up. So if you're following along online, you can go ahead and click that option and it'll overlay the two catch scenarios and it should be pretty obvious which scenario is which. So the floor scenario has this minimum bound where we're only catching 90 units of fish. Okay. Now what I really wanted to impose or, or, or give you a perception of is where did the number 90 come from? Why did I pick 90? 
actually did this twice last night. The first time I did it, I, I picked 50. But where does the number 90 come from? Just like in the spore procedure, where did the number 15% come from? You know, out of thin air, uh, you, you scoop it up with a net, you, you, it just, it's just a number. But the point is, is we want to be able to use that number to achieve some sort of conservation objective. So if I switch over to the tables now and look at the actual performance metrics over this very large time period, 1980 to 2015, we see the depletion levels uh, perform fairly similarly, uh, 44 integrated over the two hypotheses, about 44% depleted. Uh, the median catch is nearly identical. Uh, we're talking about a, a slight difference when you put a floor in there, you get slightly less catch uh, because the stock number gets to re rebuild as, as high as it would. The five-year annual variation in catch is reduced. This is a positive thing for, for planning and, and economics in our fisheries. And then the probability of closing the fishery goes to zero because we have this catch floor. Okay. But the question is, is 90 sufficient enough to achieve the conservation objectives. So you're just seeing down here on the screen the thing that the IPHC is most interested in, i.e., what is the probability that the spawning stock biomass falls below 20%? So I'll scroll down. Okay. And there you go. Under these two hypotheses, there's about a 5% chance that the um, sorry fishery will close. Got an update here. You gonna let me update? There we go. So under the 3020 rule, there's integrated over these two hypotheses. There's roughly a two percent chance that the, the fishery will close. So that's well below 20. And we've achieved that rule. And under the 3020 hypothesis, there's about a three percent chance when we put that catch floor in. Question, Scott. You were pointing at the probability of stock biomass, spawning biomass dropping below 20. Probability of closing is actually the next table up. Yeah, the yeah. probability of closing the fishery, sorry, not enough coffee yet, um, is up here. And the probability of, of the spawning stock biomass, our primary objectives, uh, is much lower. Now, if we add in these other two scenarios, where there's some sort of problem with our catch accounting system and there's theft going on, we can see that the probability of, if in fact, it's the PDO dynamics are driving this stock, the catch floor increases the probability from about 12% to 16% that we're going to fall below our spawning stock biomass conservation objective. So that's the limit threshold. The next one we're interested in is, of course, the threshold. So that's the probability of falling below 30%. And this is the point where the harvest control rule starts to ramp down towards zero. Okay. And in this case, we managed to achieve, uh, using the 30-20 rule, a probability of, of 0.25. So there's a 25% chance, or 25 times out of 100, the spawning stock biomass between 1980 and 2015 is going to fall below 30%. If we put a catch floor in there of 90, then there's 27 times out of 100 in the next 35 years, the spawning stock biomass is going to fall below our threshold reference point. So again, to reiterate, the limit, seven times out of 100, it's going to fall below the threshold. So how big can we bring that floor up? And that's the point of tuning these management procedures. So I can increase the floor to, say, 100. It'll take me a little while my computer to do it, but while we have that discussion, maybe I'll do that in the background. And we can show you how that probability will change, and you can start to see where you can increase those floor values. 
or any kind of variable you want to change on the harvest control rule. Ian pointed out this morning that you don't necessarily have to uh, have a higher floor. You could also have a higher fishing mortality rate uh, and take a little bit more or adjust the fishing mortality rate down and, and still achieve your conservation objectives that way. The basic picture is this. We have some sort of conservation measure, the spawning stock biomass relative to SB100, okay, the unfished state. So if you have a value here of 1, this means the fishery is at its pristine value. And if we want to figure out how much the TAC is going to be each year, we need to know what is the fishing mortality rate we want to apply. So the TAC is just going to be equal to the fishing mortality rate. This comes from our harvest control rule times the biomass that Ian gives us from our stock assessment model. We have defined here some limit and I think we agreed on 0 0.2 so if the spawning stock biomass falls to 20 percent of its unfished state we're going to close the fishery and if it's so if the spawning stock is somewhere between 0 and 0 0.2 the fishing mortality rate is going to be 0. The next point is what we call the threshold Okay, and if the spawning stock biomass, I think this is 0 0.3, if the spawning stock biomass falls below 0 0.3, we're going to adjust the fishing mortality rate downwards towards 0. Okay, if you were to draw this, I'll draw it on the same graph with a, another marker and just rescale the catch relative to the maximum. The catch would look something like this in green. Catch would be zero all the way through here. The TACs would be zero all the way through here. It would start to increase rapidly in a nonlinear way. And then once we get beyond this threshold, the 30-20 rule says fish at this constant fishing mortality rate, in which let's call it to say 0 0.2 for the sake of argument. Let's harvest 20% of the stock each year. So the catch would then increase linearly beyond that point. So in a harvest control rule setting, there's basically four numbers that you can play with to try and achieve your management objectives. The first number is this one, 0 0.2. You can decide, well, maybe I want to be more conservative and, and shift that to 0 0.22 or 0 0.15 and be a little less risk averse. The second number is the threshold and this would be the, the point at which you turn down. You may even want to put some desired, I'll call it a target. And this is the point where you want to be above or below this target 50% of the time. The stocks very naturally, so half the time you're going to be below the target and above the target. But there's these threshold numbers. So there's three numbers. You have a limit, a threshold, a target, and then the fourth number you need to deal with is this one here, the fishing mortality rate. Let's call it F target. So these are four numbers. And in my example, nobody's even asking me what those numbers are. The first two are kind of obvious here, the 30, 20. So you can set those values at, say, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Maybe you want the target to be 0 0.4. And the fishing mortality rate we're going to use is 20%. Or you could set this to be something like FMSY, whatever the value, some multiple of that. This was the old paradigm. The new paradigm we're trying to get you into now is in the column right next to that is probability of achieving these values 
that you want to have. So do you want to achieve, be above this target 95% of the time? You want to be above the threshold? I think we wrote down initially 75% of the time. And do you want to be around the target? I'll take a guess at 0. 0.50% of the time. And then the F target doesn't really have a, a mortality rate associated with it, but you could impose another component to the rule that I think the Pacific Council uses this, don't they, Ian? The, um, we actually have a, an F limit. Yeah. So you could have a, even a fifth number here that's basically the, an, an F limit of, say, 0 0.3, making these numbers up. And you might want to have a probability of that of, say, 0 0.9, whatever that number is you decide to do. So these are the probabilities you want to define what you can do is go through the, the simulation exercise, adjust these numbers such that you satisfy these conservation objectives, and you can satisfy these fishing mortality rate objectives. Remember, these things are actually sitting physically in our decision table that the decision makers use to, to come up with a quota each year. So it's a matter of, of finding a, a procedure or a management procedure and tuning that procedure so you achieve your desired intentions. How badly do you want to achieve a catch level of X and a catch level of Y? There it is. All right. So I hope that short little demo sort of gives you a perception. And what we'll probably do with this interface is allow you to assign those four numbers in the harvest control rule so that when you go back to your constituents and they want to play with this idea, they can actually change the probabilities, they can change the limits, they can change the targets. There'll be a drop down box of little options for you. And you can actually build your own little fishery back and forth. And I think that's going to encourage and foster a lot more discussion and debate over these trade offs, trying to understand these trade offs. Peggy. Thank you, Steve. What was the F target that that last number you added, or the next to the last one that you added? Uh, how does that differ from target? The F limit, sorry, in brown here. No, the one above it. F target. Uh, basically, I, I from what Bruce said yesterday, if you can figure out what the stock recruitment curve is, or the underlying production function of the stock, you can figure out what the fishing mortality rate. Um, is that would give you, on average, this value. So that's something that was done back in 2006 or seven by Stephen Hare using a different model that we we need to update. And and until we have uh, an acceptable stock assessment model or a suite of assessment models um, we, that have a stock recruitment curve and those sorts of things built in, we haven't been able to conduct that work yet. So, Steve, i got to tell you, I feel a little bit like the Aflac duck. Uh-oh. Um, so I'm just trying to get my arms around, my mind around. I, I, I think I get, I mean, I get how this model works. And I think what you're trying to teach us is this is what you will go through, or this is what, this is, these are the decisions that have to be made, and this is sort of how the whole big model works. But the reality is... The model that you use is more complicated than this because it's got more inputs than this. And the other thing that, and so what you're looking for from us for is just first you want to give us understanding that there are all these trade-offs, and and when you do this, then you also do this, or you do this, then you do this. Um, and so you're trying to get us to understand that. That's what's going on with when you do the model, and then when you come up with a number, this is how it works. Um, but I guess the other piece of this is all these inputs are um, not assumptions because you have data. We have a lot of data, mm -hmm. but things change and they change quickly. Mm -hmm. So, so as you as as the group generates um, a plan 
an, a management strategy, um, that's only as good as the, the uh, it's as good as the inputs you have, and it's also as good as the assumptions you have in terms of what's going to happen going forward. At that time, yeah. Right. And so, so I guess I'm, I'm just, again, trying to get my mind around it. So a couple of, one, one thing that happens here is um, this management strategy has to be constantly um, yeah. amended as all those things change, as, as whatever your assumptions, how, however uh, clear they are or unclear they are or however good they are or not good, as those change, then, then the, the strategy maybe has to be tweaked. Yeah, that's why we refer to this as a process, not a product, because and generally these, these MSCs, Paul can attest to this, they, they get revisited every sort of three to five years. As they've learned new information, they can incorporate that information into the operating model and then ask, okay, how does the current procedure perform, and is there anything we can do to modify that procedure to, to still achieve the objectives that we're trying to get to? It may be, it may be such that the new information we've learned will never be able to achieve the objectives and then it comes to the point well then let's refine the objectives and, and that's the process we go through. But what you're looking for from the MSAB is just sort of this uh, ground truthing if you will of what how important these various trade-offs are. So yeah and, and I wanted to do so in a way with, with a very simple model um, so I can bring everybody up to speed. Like you said, I'm trying to teach you. Uh, I'm, at the same time, I'm teaching myself because uh, listening to, you, to the discussion around the table is also important for me. Sure, sure. Just touch on a little bit more, John, that you're right, it's, it's, it's something that needs constant amendment, but what you're trying to do in the, in the sort of interim between those incremental changes is, is to develop policies that are going to be robust to how, how little you might understand about the population at that that point. So it isn't, it isn't just like uh, to find the sort of perfect control rules or something at one time. It's to find control rules that are going to be robust to your understanding of that and that understanding obviously changes over time. Bruce. Yeah, Bruce Gabrus. Uh, I'm still struggling a little bit, uh, Steve, with if I take this model, give this website to uh, uh, an interested party that's related to the fishery, and I tell them, go forth and you can change these things. Um, my concern uh, is that they're going to say, well, it, it, they're, they're going to, I think most people, without your astute tutelage of us telling us where the, where the cautions are, they're going to assume that this is right. And uh, I'm not so sure that we're not going to, if I, if I recommend that to somebody, I'm not so sure we're not going to create more confusion. So what you're doing here is you're te you are teaching us, you are our teacher. Absence the teacher from this model, um, I, I think that might be some challenges there with the average user who just plugs in the numbers and changes the variables and gets the result that they want. Yeah, um, you bring up a, a good point. I'll remind you, uh, this isn't an ATM machine, and it's not like, uh, you know, Gary can go home, open up his iPad, and come up with a new management procedure, and then the commissioners get a phone call from him saying, hey, here's what we're going to do. Um, I gave this, ironically, I gave this thing to my five-year-old last night on the iPad while she was eating dinner just to watch her interact with it, and it, it kind of blew me away. I'm actually starting to feel old because she would figured stuff out way quicker than I did. She goes, I can, I can get this color to go be bigger than that color, and I'm like, how'd you do that? <laughs> but it, it's pretty intuitive. Um, the point is, is that the alternative way of presenting this information is to just go to the annual meeting, shove it all down your throats, and, and say, trust us, we're highly trained professionals. Um, that hasn't worked for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, it really is about a learning and education process, um, and and I hope that you know when Chris Spore goes back to his group of ideas and he's going to say, "Hey, I solved the world's problems," um, they're going to say, "How?" and he can pull this tool up and actually use it to demonstrate how his new procedure 
performs against the conditional constant cash procedure. So it really is a speaking point and not an ATM. Yeah, that's, sorry for, for those on the webinar, um, Loli Lo just asked a question pertaining to the use of multiple models and, and trying to figure out which model is more appropriate to use and, and which one is more robust in terms of achieving the management objectives. And that's the, the interface we built here, Lo, is, is to try and do exactly that. We can play these different scenarios where we have recruitment driven by a PDO or we have some uh, bycatch problems that are bigger than we think they are, how robust are these different procedures? And then we can actually ca calculate the probability of, of achieving an objective. And the, the real take-home lesson here today and yesterday that we, we discovered was um, when you sit down in, in a room full of people like this, we all have conflicting objectives. And that's a good thing because that's what management is about, is it's trying to make trade-offs to satisfy these conflicting objectives. And, and what we're trying to do here is build a, a framework in which we have stakeholder participation in helping us shape and guide the harvest policy here at the IPHC. The alternative, as I just said before, is trust us. We're highly profane professionals, and we'll, uh, you can live with our consequences. Dan. Dan Hall, uh, it seems that the other focus you want to put on this is those, those, those factors that have the greatest effect on achieving management objectives and to, um, and to not be distracted by some of the other variables that could affect the outcome people want to look at, so right. thinking like um, hook competition and some other things that have come up in the recent years that in my, my, my perception is they've been additions to the model in a way that people kind of latch onto those as a, a, additional outcomes and, and those would still be in the model but those don't become the focus in order to achieve the objectives. We're looking more at the, the primary factors that we should be adjusting. Yeah, your point is, is spot on. When you, If you look back and think about the evolution of, of how the apportionment scheme came into place, you know, the first iteration of that was, was just to assume that catchability was constant across all areas. And then uh, subsequent years, we went and started to look at some of those assumptions and looked at hook competition and the number of missing baits as a measure of total density and, and tried to adjust uh, the, the relative CPUEs to standardize them and correct for the, the spatial differences in catchability. That's something you can build in here and, and ask, does that even make a difference? Or, or And you don't even have to do that either. You can just do it with and without, as Ray has done in the past and shown that, you know what, you get a 5% increase in the quota here if, if you adjust for hook timing, hook competition, etc. cetera. Um, I think Ray's shown clearly, Ian's probably knowing this better than I am, that it, the, the more sensitive variable is, is not the timing of the survey, except in area 2A, but it's actually been the hook competition that's more important. The last point I'll make is, is that 
there's a huge number of iterations or permutations and combinations of scenarios and management procedures you can throw at this. That's why it's important to have a primary objective so you can screen away a lot of this stuff um, that, that may or may not be important. Ocean acidification, you know, is that really important? Uh, is it something we can't manage, but how, how much would it affect the, the stock dynamics? It may turn out to be very important. We just haven't tested that hypothesis yet. Okay, thanks, Ian. So, Ian? Sorry. <laughs> What's your name again? <laughs> His wife's having your baby. <laughs> and he's starting to grow hair. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I'd like to do is, is um, try to move us forward in terms of developing alternative um, harvest policies. And Steve, can you cue up that presentation? So we thought about this a little bit yesterday afternoon. There we are. Okay. Just go to the second one. I'll do it here. So a lot of our discussion yesterday uh, really was focusing on conservation as the primary objective. I think that was essentially the first words that came out of almost everybody's mouths is that with no, with no stock, we have no fishery. Um, and that's good uh, because th that means that you know, we've got some real baseline in terms of what our understanding is. And that's actually fairly coherent with what the existing harvest policy the Commission has is. You know. Uh, reference points and control rules aside, um, conservation is the major goal that we have. So, and the other thing that came out of this, at least to my mind, in, in listening to the comments and writing them down, was that the the economic objectives are, are largely, though not entirely, uh, twinned with the yield objectives. So, uh, once we've got the yields sorted out, then the, the, the economic objectives kind of flow from those yields, and uh, they're, they're pretty similar to them. Again, that's that's kind of a good thing. So. This suggested to us that the, the initial investigations could have a fairly straightforward framework in that, one, we'd be identifying the stock conservation objective. Uh, we could identify a harvest minimum, and that's what Steve was just going through, forward with you here and looking at a floor in the, in the harvest, which would actually act uh, as a control rule as well. And then uh, also to identify what the acceptable harvest variance is. This is another thing that came into the discussions uh, quite repeatedly yesterday was we'd like to have some stability in the, in the harvest so that we're not sort of jumping all over the place. And you can see that there's a certain amount of that that is going to be unavoidable if you've got uh, recruitment, for example, that's PDO driven or something. You see the variance in that is considerably higher than it is when you have a deterministic scenario. But the PDO is certainly the the best correlate we found for recruitment at this stage, and again, it's it's a correlate. Not uh, we're not trying to imply it's cause and effect, but it certainly is a reasonably strong correlate compared to anything else we've looked at for this. So, um, but I think we uh, we can sort of start from where we are right now um, as the sort of going from the familiar into the unknown, if you will, uh, and so that what we could look at here is, is what are the existing objectives, and this is what I reviewed for you yesterday afternoon or yesterday morning, um, looking at what are the existing objectives, the reference points, the harvest rates, control rules, and performance metrics, and then we can set about trying to modify some of those to reflect the alternative targets that we might have for this. Uh, so we could modify, um, as Steve was just talking about, the harvest rate, the control rules, the reference points, uh, and looking at the, the modified objectives that you come up with. And then to look at the alternative performance metrics and refine that harvest rate and control rules and reference points as we go along to try to do this. And this is what Steve was trying to get at yesterday, is that we can tweak or tune some of these things uh, to try and get at the objectives. And then this is an iterative process. The secondary part of this thing, and this is a bit long term, a long, longer term thing, is to explore some alternative assumptions about system characteristics. And what this would be is looking at alternative scenarios. Uh, so if we have an understanding of how competition with some other species may be driving halibut dynamics, this is something you can work into in the background. And what I wanted to stress on this and, and where we are right now is that that involves some fairly detailed background modeling and producing the operating model. 
So I think we want to try and start reasonably simply in terms of building the halibut model, recognizing that um, one of the fundamental things that people want to get at is spatial structure in the, mo in the, in the model. And so Steve has been working on this, but we're not there yet. Um, but I, we wanted to try and identify for you where we are and what the path forward might be on this. So this is kind of the framework that we talked about yesterday afternoon about starting from some place where, where we are and going into alternative places. And so looking at the existing harvest policy, um, I reviewed for you yesterday what some of our stock management objective in this case is based around probabilities, trying to get the spawning biomass um, with a probability of 80% of or 0.8 that it's going to be greater than the threshold all the time. And so one of the things that um, Steve was presenting to you yesterday was uh, when he was looking at sort of, for example, the F in this, you were using FMSY for that, right? So one of the things you may have seen in some of our, our previous work on this is that we didn't get to some of the low points on this thing when we do some of our long-term scenarios. That's because the F that we were using was less than MSY. It's probably somewhere around 0.85 of FMSY. So we had a more conservative harvest rate uh, than you might be using in that. So that's, just, that's one of the things that you can tune on this thing is what is the target harvest rate we're looking at. The other ones are the reference points that we talked about yesterday and, and Steve just talked about this morning, and the control rules. Right now we're using a 30-20 control rule uh, that has uh, a linear ramp down from fishing mortality from the target point to zero between FB30 and B20. It's been pointed out that this is a pretty aggressive um, harvest control rule. So once you start, once you get below 30, bang, you start going down in a hurry. So for example, the Pacific Fisheries Management Council uses a 40-10 rule. I know, Dan, if it, it's, is it a 40-10 rule in the, uh, in the North Pacific Council as well? People do that. Do you guys know either? either it's tiered. Oh, it's tiered. Okay, yeah. 40, 40, yeah, it's 40, 40 10 in the Pacific Council, right? Is it? Okay. So the, the other thing that we haven't talked about and I want to um, ask Ian to talk about here just briefly is, is the performance metrics uh, that we're using in this. Right now we're looking at, we've looked at several things, not all of them were reported in uh, that I talked to you about yesterday, and the ratio of spawning biomass to B100, the percent of time that you're below the threshold, the realized average harvest rate, the average catch, the variance of the catch, again one that's fairly important, uh, the frac some fraction of the maximum yield that can be achieved in this, uh, we've also looked at things like what's the average weight in the catch, uh, the average size in the catch. Those are all important to harvesters, I think, in there. But the the link between the performance metrics and what you see at, at an annual meeting in the decision table is is the columns in the decision table, and that's where the performance metrics come in. And I'd like to ask Ian to talk about this a bit right now. Thanks, Bruce. This really is the the crossover point between the MSAB process and the, the current management process with the decision table. When we introduced the decision table last year, Steve and I were very much planning for it to be a product that we could use both moving forward in terms of the annual meeting cycle and the decision making, but also very applicable to this process and, and determining the, the various performance metrics from uh, different uh, management procedures applied to the to the MSE, and in that in that vein, maybe it's worth backing up a little bit to talk about how we ended up with the table we ended up with at, at last year's annual meeting. So we started out with a very simple table. It actually only had I think five columns, and I presented that at the interim meeting, and those five columns were really just the the scientific review that we held last October and myself sitting down and saying, well, what, what performance metrics do we think people would want to see? So we came up with a few. We said, well, they're probably be interested in the probability of dropping below SB 30% and 20%. And clearly we need some reference of trend in there. So what's the probability the stock's going to be lower next year than it is this year? Um, and, and so we, we included those metrics. And then we, we also realized, well, there's going to be a lot of interest in what's going to happen to my quota next year. So if we make a decision this year, what's the probability that my quota will go down again next year? Now, obviously, that includes a lot of other factors, right? So the, the, the commissioners could choose to make that quota smaller or larger based on a lot of different information. So what we did in that column was to say, if you applied the harvest control rule this year and you applied it again next year, this is the probability that your, that your quota would end up going down next year. Now note that the decision table for the annual for the annual meeting and for uh, annual decision making is focused on 
where we are this year and where we're going next year. And so because of that, it can't include some of these metrics like what's the long-term variance in catch over a 50-year simulation. That's really not relevant to that particular thing. That's relevant in, in developing a strategy that you would then apply to, to generate annual management decisions, but it's not relevant to the annual decision table that's produced. So there are some kinds of quantities like variance and catch that aren't really applicable to the, um, to the annual decision table that we, we present at the meeting. So that was the interim meeting. I presented that, and we immediately got some feedback from the commissioners from other people saying, well, actually, there's some other performance metrics we'd like to see. So it's interesting to know if the stock's going to decline, but we really need to know, is it a meaningful decline? So instead of just having a column saying, what's the probability the spawning biomass will be lower in next year than it was this year, we, we added another column that said, what's the probability it's going to be 10% lower, appreciably lower than it is this year? Because we might have a, a stock trajectory that's quite flat, and there might be a high probability that it goes down, but if it's going down half a percent, that's well within our uncertainty in the estimate to begin with. So we added that, that column, and, and the point here is that we're, we're trying to produce the quantities in those columns that people need to make decisions. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's actually pretty easy for me to fill out the columns. It's a fair bit of work to run all the models behind the scenes and do it. But the point is that I need to be providing the information that you guys need, everybody, to evaluate the decisions and to make them for the conference board and the PAG to make recommendations to the commissioners, for the commissioners to evaluate the risk. So we, we, added, we added several columns as, as time went on. We actually added a three-year projection as well. And I was asked to add longer projections, and I declined uh, respectfully um, for a lot of reasons, primarily, primarily because recruitment dynamics and trends in size at age are something that we don't yet have the ability to predict very well. And so in an annual decision-making table, if I make a 10-year projection, the dynamics 10 years from now are going to be dominated by things that haven't happened yet and I would argue are largely unpredictable. Now that, that contrasts, contrasts quite a bit to the MSE process because in the MSE process, remember, we're in a flight simulator. So we can, we can say, well, this is, this, here's a scenario where size at age goes up, here's a scenario where it goes down, and we can look at longer term projections under both of those scenarios and see what sorts of policies perform well. That still doesn't tell us in a tactical sense, is it actually going to go up or down next year? But it allows us to evaluate policies that, that will be robust to either of those things. So, you know, again, there are some, some slight differences in the usage of, of the two tables, but I guess the point is that this is where the two conversations really come together, in that the performance metrics that we, we think are relevant and necessary for the MSE process many of those are going to map over into the, the columns of the decision table. And I'm, 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 I'm really interested to see if we come up with anything else that's relevant to the process. So as you guys are thinking about performance metrics, be thinking not only in terms of long-term performance of, of a set of simulations in a, in a flight simulator, but also in terms of what, what sorts of quantities would you want to be making decisions on year to year because I can very easily add those to, to the decision table, and likewise, I can remove columns that aren't, aren't interesting to people. So I think that, that's kind of where these, these two processes come together, and, where, and it's where all that effort that, that we all spent, me and, and presenting it and you guys learning it, in sort of getting comfortable and getting to know the decision table, or maybe not comfortable yet, but uh, at least familiar with it, um, all of that investment is now starting to pay off because it's the same vehicle that we're going to be using to evaluate these results as well. Comments on that? Tom. Yeah, Tom Markin. I have kind of a general question, and, and I mean, this model is kind of a point in time because you don't want to do projections out in the future because unknowns. But in saying that, then you're, it's, it's almost like this is past performance. We're looking at a trend over past years. And I'm just kind of curious, I know this is the ignorance on my part, I don't know this. Does the survey data each year mirror fairly closely to what the catch per unit effort occurs to in the fleet? Or is there some variation there? Uh, because it seems like at some point you have to do some trend projection forward to see if you're kind of heading in the right direction. But if there's enough variability, and we'll call it noise, I guess, from a year-to-year -year point source, you can't really devise a trend other than see retrospectively, yeah, we guessed it right in the past, but no, we didn't. So, 
it seems like you almost have to do some kind of projection three to five years to at least tentatively to kind of get an idea of where you're going. So that's exactly right. So we, we are, in fact, making short-term projections. I did a one- and a three-year projection in the decision table. To answer your first question, does the survey and the fisheries generally correspond? And the, the answer there is most positively yes. Uh, we, get, we get quite good correspondence. The actual percentage change year to year varies somewhat. Sometimes the fishery increases or decreases a little bit more quickly than the survey. Uh, but generally the two are, are highly corroboratory and the, the patterns we see, the general trends we see across regulatory areas are quite similar between the survey and the fishery. In terms of making projections, I think it's important to remember that even estimating the biomass and the recruitment that we're, that's occurring, say, right now in, or will occur next year in 2014, that's already a several year projection. So we don't actually see these fish until they're seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And so the recruitments that are coming into the stock, we, we already have six or eight year classes in the water out there that we really don't know anything about. So even to get to the current point at which we are making decisions, we're actually making a bit of a projection. Now we do have the survey index, and that tells us about the biomass of fish that are six to eight years old plus, and likewise the fishery corroborates that information. We get age data to tell us about that. Um, but there's, there's a point at which, as we move farther out into the future, the, the prediction isn't going to be a useful tool. In fact, it could actually be misleading if we make the wrong assumption about the dynamics. And so my argument for doing one- and, and three-year only projections is that those are projections that are not yet contaminated by events that, we, we, that haven't occurred or that we have absolutely no information about. Um, you're, you're quite right to point out that the thing we really want to know is where we're going to be five years from now. And that's, unfortunately, the one thing that you can't learn from a stock assessment. We have great data about what's already happened, and it tells us about where we happen to be right now, but it doesn't necessarily tell us where we're going. What we, what we can know is that we can look at, at, the, at past performance of how things have changed over time, and we can look at what have trends in recruitment been, are there, are there factors that, that would tend to lead us to think that recruitment will be higher or lower in the future, things like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And likewise, we can look at the rate of change in various things. For, so, for example, the, the size at age, the size of fish in the stock, is something that has changed dramatically over the record, but it's something that changes quite slowly. And so that's where I, I am comfortable making a three-year projection, and, and that's, that's something that I added during last year's process to actually make a smart three-year projection of trends in size at age using the trend we've seen over the recent couple of years because size at age is something... It doesn't change very quickly, and we'll have time to, to see it coming, basically, as it changes. There's, there's basically no chance that we're going to go from where we are this year to fish that are twice as big next year. I mean, we, we sort of know that looking back through the historical record. So that's, that's kind of that balance. And I, I guess to, to help you feel a little more comfortable about that, um, I, I think it's useful to think about something like weather forecasting. Uh, you, 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 you look at the, the weather forecast and you, know, you look at tomorrow's forecast and you, you think, okay, they're not great at this, but I, I might, it might be worth looking at tomorrow's forecast. If you're, if you're really trying to plan your weekend, you look at the five-day forecast and you think, well, they almost never get this right, but if, if, you know, I still need to make plans. And then when you get out to the 10 or the two-week forecast, you know, forget about it. It turns out that the weatherman, after 10 days, your best prediction of the weather on that day is the 100-year average of the weather on that calendar day, not, the, not what the guy's pro projecting. So it's, we, we have a similar problem here in that our, our ability to, to project degrades quite quickly as we go out in the future. John. So this might, uh, John Woodruff, this might be a bad question, but I guess, again, trying to get my arms around this, one thing that drives this, I mean, obviously drives it hugely is this spawning biomass. So I, I guess two questions. The, the virgin biomass, the uh, unfished biomass, is that number always the same or does that, does that change somewhere? And then the, the other question is the spawning biomass, I mean, that you determine that based on survey data, based on size of age, based on all these things. And um, I guess I'm curious about how that, I think I've, I've heard this before, I'm sure, but how that gets determined and also if that, if that, that uh, unfished biomass number is always the same. 
So those are two excellent questions, and I'll, I'll start with the second one because it's easier. Um, you've hit the nail on the head with the first one for sure. The, the spawning biomass calculation is an estimate based on all the information we have from the, from the stock. So we use the fishery data and the survey data. We have the age composition that tells us the demographics of the population, what proportions of the stock are at different ages. We assume a constant maturity schedule at age, and that is something that we're in the process of, of doing some research to check up on because it's, it's something that does change in some, some stocks. Um, but the evidence that we have for halibut is that although the maturity at size has changed pretty dramatically as the size of, of fish has changed, the maturity at age seems to have stayed pretty consistent. Um, regardless of how big that fish, that female halibut is, when it gets to 11 or 12 years old, they seem to start spawning. Now, we don't know whether those spawners are as effective when they're smaller fish or not, or whether they, they may perhaps spawn once and then, and then skip a year and then, and then spawn again. Um, if, they're, if they tend to be small for their age. There's a lot we don't know about that, but the, the information that we do have about maturity uh, would suggest that that's been pretty stable over time. So the, our spawning biomass estimate is just a product of the numbers of fish that we, that we estimate to be in each age class, the, 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 the um, maturity curve telling us how, what fraction of those numbers are mature at each age, and the current weighted age, which, which weighted age is something we can measure very well. We have tens of thousands of fish measured every year. We get a pretty good estimate um, area by area and then amalgamated to the coastwide level of, of what the size and age of those fish is. So we get a pretty good estimate of that. Now, it doesn't include the, any potential fecundity effects, so we assume that egg output is proportional to weight of the fish. And there are fish species where there's evidence that the amount, the number of eggs produced can actually increase more quickly than the weight. So big fish can produce more eggs proportionally for their weight. We don't have any evidence of that for halibut, but it is out there for some other species. So that's how we get spawning biomass. Now the first question, and I can always count on you to bring up the really tough ones, uh, this, and this is a good one. So your question was, where does the SB100 come from, and does it always stay the same? And the answer is, well, the, the answer is that there's two answers here. There's one answer with regard to how we calculate these reference points in the harvest policy. And then the second answer is what's actually going on out there in the stock. So in the stock, you can imagine at any point in time, if we hadn't fished, we, we, we've taken 7 billion pounds of halibut out of the stock in the last 100 years. If we hadn't fished halibut at all, at any point in that record, there would be an amount of halibut out there in the Pacific Ocean, and it wouldn't have stayed the same over that whole hundred years. In each year, it might, might be higher or lower depending on the, the recruitments that had fed into that, the, the size at age of the fish in that particular year. And so in any given year, there is an SB100 that's consistent with the recruitments that have occurred and the size at age that's currently being realized in the stock. And so that essentially is the equilibrium level associated with the current biology. Now the harvest policy doesn't necessarily track that on an annual basis. The harvest policy was based on managing, and, and it built, was built into these simulations, was based on managing to calculating the 30% and 20% based on a low recruitment regime. So that's basically saying that when the stock gets big due to really big recruitments associated with a high PDO, we'll still be estimating the SB 30% based on the low recruitment regime. And that was built into the simulation. So the performance of the, of the current harvest policy was based on that mismatch essentially being built into the, to the rules. They're, they're just a set of driving rules, right? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not implying that that is what the, the equilibrium stock size is. It's just that's what was built into the current harvest policy. Where that becomes an issue is that we are now in a situation, and, and sorry, the second part of that is that the, the harvest policy was also built around the concept that size at age would be density dependent, so that when we did have low recruitment, we would see better than average size at age. Now, the conundrum we're in at the moment is that we have low recruitment and low size at age. And so we are in a situation where the stock, imagine again that sort of annual estimate of SB 100 percent 
that's actually going to be far lower than the SB 100% that's being applied in the harvest control rule. Because we're in a situation where we have a combination of both low recruitment and low size at age. And it turns out that these, the difference between the SB 100% with good recruitment and good size at age and or poor recruitment and poor size at age and the combinations there moves that over a very wide range. The, the, the equilibrium level of the stock would be at changes dramatically based on those two, those two factors. Thank you, Ian. That, as you said, John, that's a very good question. That's one that's occupied quite a bit of Ian's time over the last little while, so getting that understanding. And, and not only does the SB100 change, the associated reference points change along with them, so it affects how you interpret uh, the harvest policy and the effective control rules on the estimated biomass at, at each year. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is come back to this um, slide talking about starting from where we are and see if we can gain some agreement on uh, the process going forward from here because what this is important to is the way that Steve builds the operating model uh, and the characteristics that he needs to put into that as well as into the, the uh, tool that he's developed for you in terms of the management strategy uh, evaluation uh, report. So what I'd like to come back to is starting with our existing harvest policy, what elements of that do you want to see changed or do we think should be changed uh, as we go forward in, in building uh, a new kind of uh, policy. So we have, um, as Ian was just talking about, we have reference points, we have a harvest rate, uh, we have control rules, and we have the performance metrics. That's the sort of summary of our, our existing harvest policy. Um, it's based upon an objective of um, having the spawning biomass not drop below the spawning biomass threshold uh, less than 20% of the time, more than 20% of the time, excuse me. So uh, what I'd like to come back to is each, each one of these um, reference points, harvest rates, controls, and so forth, but then uh, starting off with the objectives. We had yesterday a discussion about conservation as one of our primary goals. So the question we have right now is, is the uh, point two and point three uh, and the probability associated with those an appropriate goal for us to be investigating right now. How would you like to see that changed? So, Scott. Oh, Scott Meyer. So this is a, a question related to what you just said. Uh, is there evidence from other fisheries that when you're in a low productivity regime that you have to have a higher B target? You know, like, like is B40 more sustainable in the long term than B30 when you're, when you're in a low productivity regime? So there's definitely evidence from, from some stocks of a, a stronger stock recruit relationship than we see for halibut. I mean, that's really the question is when you, when you get down to low biomass, do you start to see a strong response of lower recruitment when you've got lower biomass? For Pacific halibut, we've seen some of the better recruitments in the time series come out of a period of fairly low spawning biomass. And that's consistent with, our, with, with previous analyses that recruitment for halibut seems to be driven largely by the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or at least is correlated with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, driven by factors that are also correlated with that. Um, so we, we don't have much evidence that at low spawning biomass, we tend to get lower recruitment. In fact, we've had some good recruitments that have come out of some fairly low spawning biomass in the middle part of last century. That said, we know the relationship goes through the origin. We know if we don't have spawners, we don't get recruits. So we know at some point it starts to bend over. And this is, this is I guess, where, where Bruce's analogy with the point on the map where the dragons are is, is that we don't, we haven't, we haven't, had the stock at a level that appears to have compromised its ability to produce good recruitments, but that's contingent on the envelope that we've actually explored in the stock. And so taking the spawning biomass to a level appreciably below that, we don't know exactly where that, that threshold or at least a stronger relationship might, might occur. Yeah, Scott. Uh, just a quick follow-up. So if I understood what you said before correctly, um, B30 is a smaller number when you're in a low productivity regime than it is when you're in a high pro. Okay. I just want to make sure. I'm... Okay. 
Bruce. Well, Bruce, this is Bruce Gabris. The, the question he asked, are there, I mean, is there, do we have any evidence that the B2030 scenario is not working well? I mean, I mean, it would indicate that the fishery is still relatively healthy. We got some concerns about it, but I guess I don't have any basis to give you a recommendation. We should change that. Um, it's what it appears to be working. Is it optimum? Who knows? But is it bad? Probably not. So maybe that's one thing we want to leave the way it is for now, unless we have some reason to believe that it needs to be changed. I think that's a good point, uh, Bruce. I think our our our, uh, our qualification of that is that part of our understanding of that has been based on the kind of simulation model that was was built into that evaluation, and whether and, and that was in particular based on the core area of the stock. So it's it's somewhat conditioned on that on that process. But I'd like to invite um, Ian and Steve to comment on this as well. I mean, it, it it probably has the characteristics of the stock behavior as a whole, but probably not entirely, which is why we want to update the, the policy. But I'm asking Steve and, Eve, Steve and Ian to comment. I guess a couple comments. One, one is that Steve laid out yesterday one of the important aspects of a, a harvest control rule is that it has a feedback loop in it. And this the current policy definitely has a feedback loop in it. As Steve and I have both pointed out over the last year, several in, on many occasions, we, we've got a, a growing mismatch between the, the way in which the current harvest policy was defined and the current dynamics of the stock as we understand them. And one of those mismatches is the, the, the situation that we're in now where we're seeing low size at age and low recruitment. And that's something that was included as a sensitivity analysis in the original harvest policy development, but not it wasn't the, the, the primary um, it, it wasn't it wasn't built into the basic analysis um, as most of the results were, were were presented. That said, you know the, the question being, are these reference points is this control rule working or not? Um, I think we we really need a little bit more of a, a, a longer term perspective on the stock to, to integrate what we've seen over the historical record with where we currently are. And that's one of the things I've spent a lot of time working on this year is developing some models that use more of our historical data. Um, I'll be presenting a lot more of that information later this fall, but I, I think to, to really understand where we are, we need to look back prior to 1996 to get some perspective on it. I think even uh, Ian's very, very correct about that. Even the existing harvest policy, I think, only went back as far as 73, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of the data that were put into it. Ian's been working very hard on trying to stitch together data sets that go back further. They all have their limitations in terms of, in terms of what they actually reflect. Um, so how well do the data that were collected reflect, say, the entire stock if we're trying to do that? And that's, that's one of the limitations on that. But, but Ian's quite correct that we want to try to get a longer time series into this. And I, I may just add... I have nothing really more to add other than that I think the discussion has sort of outlined the four major scenarios that when you would have in a management procedure. We know high recruitment, low recruitment regimes have occurred. We know that um, there's been periods of, of small size at age and periods of large size at age. And, and the permutations of those four things put together basically encompass a range of, of you know, things we need to deal with in developing a new harvest policy. I think a, a general question that's probably in everyone's heads is, why aren't we just taking these new models and, and coming up with a new harvest policy like we did in the past? And uh, uh, I'm not sure I, I have a, a clear reason for that other than that that's never worked in the past. I think you had a question. And then uh, John Woodruff, yeah. So I just want to be clear on 30-20. The 20 is if you fall below 20% of this virgin biomass, then there is no fishing. That's how that rule works. And when you get to thir less than 30, between 20 and 30% of that same number, uh, then you ratchet down whatever your harvest rate is. And that's sort of what we've been doing. 
I'm sorry, we have never invoked that sort of ratcheting down process to my recollection because we have never perceived that we were below 30. In retrospect, in looking at some of the previous analysis, it looks as though initially it looked like we had dropped below it, but when Ian looked at, again, in curing the retrospective stuff, it doesn't look like we did drop below that. But um, in a contemporaneous sense, we didn't, we've never invoked that, uh, that ratcheting down. So just thinking aloud, and it's John Woodruff again, dangerous. Um, um, so that 20%, 30% are applied for the whole of the resource. And you know where this breaks down at the annual meeting, it seems like, is by area. Because uh, you could have an area where you could see CPUEs on the increase and an area where you can see them still on a decrease and yet you could get to that 30 percent number and and that's where that's where the discussion really starts I think. But John I think that's absolutely correct and that's one of the uh, conundrums that we're in right now and why it's important to build this and you might be getting a message here. <laughs> Um, one of the things that's, that's important to everybody here is this spatial component uh, for exactly the way you've outlined it, John, and, and um, one of the reasons why it's going to take some time to build the operating model correctly is because that spatial component is very difficult to, to put into the model. And the other thing about it is that it's going to be conditioned on what you, what you might assume to be where migration rates or if we do it in a different way that will just ha it still needs to have some linkage between it. And Ian and Steve and I have talked about this one point about having perhaps not a fully spatial model but something that say might have three areas instead of seven or eight areas in it. Um, but I, I, Ian, I think you probably got some thoughts on this too. Yeah, John, that's, uh, your, your point is a good one that the, the current harvest control rule a spawning biomass, 20% and 30% applies at the coast-wide level, but in fact the harvest rate targets are area specific. So each area, the, the eastern areas having a higher target harvest rate than the western areas. One of the things that I think has been missing from the process in the past, and we really tried to re-emphasize this year, is closing the loop. When, when the decision is made to to adjust harvest or to adjust catch levels in each area, that corresponds to a coastwide harvest rate, and we can we can we can add those things up, and we can see where that gets us back on a coastwide level, and and how that relates to where we are, with regard to to SB thirty percent and SB twenty percent, and the harvest rate target on a coastwide level. Because you're you're absolutely right that that can get lost in the shuffle. We see that we're not. We're not below the 30% level, and so we move down to the area-specific resolution and catch decisions are made on an area-by-area -area basis, but those add up to a, a realized harvest rate at the coast-wide level that may or may not be consistent with the original harvest policy. And in fact, what we've, what we've estimated in the last several years is that the harvest rates, when you add them back up, have been in excess of what we would, we, the, the target implied by our current harvest policy. So I have uh, Bruce, Chris, and Brad. <laughs> yeah, it's Bruce Gabris. You know, the, you, you pose the question if there's something that we need to rethink about the 30-20 rule um, as far as this going moving forward in the modeling. And it would appear to me from what um, both Bruce and Ian and, and had said that you don't really have a recommendation to deviate from that. And as a member of the SAB, uh, MSAB, I guess is, uh, as a member of the MSAB, if you're not recommending or have some way of convince us that it needs to be changed, or at least information that indicates it should be changed, then I don't have any basis to do anything but keep it the way it is and let's move on with some of the other topics to see if there's something that we do have energy about that we want to change. So I'm not, I'm not here to think that we should change something for the sake of change unless we got a damn good reason for it. Thanks, Bruce. Chris? I guess just building off uh, the point, the last point is Chris Spore. I, I don't think it's it's that we're, we're necessarily looking to, to recommend a change to, to 2030. I think what this process is going to allow us to do is see how 2030 plays out in different scenarios, and then we can say, oh, geez, it's not working. Maybe then we have to circle back to that objective and tweak it, as we talked about yesterday. I mean, that's the key point, I think. I mean, basically, I think around the room, no one's 
yelling for a scream to uh, change, screaming for a change to 2030. It would sort of and we talked about this at the last meeting. Let's evaluate what we're doing now as as a first step. Yeah, I, I think that sort of is the fourth bullet point we have here on the on the slide is looking at evaluating how well things are working and then revisiting them. So, Brad, you know, Ian said that you can't predict very well long long term into the future. So if we revisit the past back to the low point in the stocks, I think you used the word yesterday, touchstone. Could you use the 2030 rule, uh, overlay that at that low point and how those metrics would look today? Like you, you, the fishery didn't close, obviously, but how dangerous did we get to that precipice? Ian, do you want to touch on it? Sure. We, we could definitely look and see where we would have been, where, where we estimate the stock was relative to SB 30 percent and SB 20 percent and how much reduction would have been called for had we been applying this policy. Um, it's also possible to, to think about harvest control rules that actually use those levels as well. So you could define either as your limit or as your, your some point on that ramp the biomass that we, we think was out there in the 1970s and say, you know, anytime we get below that level, we're going to start ramping down the, the harvest or we're going to start ramping down that harvest such that we don't go below that level. So both of those things are quite possible. We've been hampered a bit in recent years because the stock assessment model has only included the most recent few years and so we haven't had that longer term perspective. Um, and as, as you'll see in this, in this year's process, I've done a lot of work over this, this past year to give us a little bit more of a historical perspective so we can actually start looking back and, and making comparisons to those early periods. So that's quite doable. I think there's perhaps another way to look at that, Brad, and, and Steve just talking about that. Uh, one of the exercises we've done in, in with the shrimp fisheries in British Columbia, and I know Doug Butterworth has done this and all kinds of people have done this around the world, is if we were to say take Ian's assessment that goes way back to 1920 up to the present day, and let's say we back up to say 1996. We know what the recruitments are based on the assessment. If we then reapply these new management procedures, that, and we can ask the question, where would the fishery be today had we done this in 1996? And that's a really informative lesson because we've already lived that part of the past, and it's almost like going back in a time machine and saying, hey, what would happen if we'd done that? And that's a, a, probably an, an exercise that's worth doing. Scott, uh, maybe uh, this is too soon, but um, I, I don't, <clears throat> I don't have any problem with the thirty twenty rule. I think it's great. I think another, I mean, obviously we don't want to. Uh, people were talking yesterday about well, we want want to provide for conservation, and then we want to maximize the harvest, take whatever we can after we've provided for that, and I was. Uh, thinking about that in terms of a control rule, what that might look like. Obviously, no, we don't want the stock to always be right at B30, right on the precipice of lowering the harvest rate. So I was thinking of it in terms of a control rule maybe that uh, has a target that's higher than B30. I don't know where you'd set it. And then uh, the other thing that I've heard for many years, uh, people want to see the catch limits adjusted based on what CPUE does or WPUE in the survey. So one, one type of control rule I know that's been advocated, especially in fisheries where you don't have a lot of data, but this is a fishery where we do have a lot of data, but is to, is to say that <clears throat> um, you set the next year's total allowable catch based on the proportional change in the WPUE from the survey or maybe it's some combination of survey and fishery weighted thing. Or I'm not sure how you do that. But um, So if the WPUE went up compared to last year, you could bump the catch up proportionally. And of course, that all depends where you're starting from. What it was last year, you wouldn't want to do that if you were at a low level, because then if the WPUE went down, you would um, actually you would move the catch down. But it seems like uh, you got to do that conditional on being around some target. Just something to consider as a another alternative control rule. Thanks, Scott. I think uh, 
a target is, is a reasonable thing to do. Right now, we're doing this in a probabilistic sense, but a target is a lot more easier to digest for a lot of folks. But I'd be interested in Ian's comments on the, the idea of a WPUE-based control rule. My suspicion is it probably wouldn't differ greatly from the assessment itself. <laughs> No, actually, I mean there are there are other fisheries that are managed on on similar rules, um, and as as Bruce points out, and Steve actually mentioned this yesterday, the stock assessment really should just be a smoother for the data anyway. Um, that the trends in the data should be quite evident in the model results. Anytime the model is deviating from the data in a way that you can't explain, there's something wrong with the model because the data just are what they are. So really, the stock assessment provides a, a sophisticated smoother for the survey trend. And the things that it can account for are mismatches that can grow over time in terms of what's going on in the fishery versus what's going on in the survey if there are different demographics going on. The survey actually has information about fish that are sublegal in there. And so the, the assessment basically integrates that information and provides you with, with the estimate. That said, um, there's something to be said for a very simple rule that everybody can just look and see. You, know, you can look in the table, the survey table, and see, well, if the survey went up, I know my catch is going up. Or if the survey went down, I know the catch is going down. So there, there's some, even, even though it may not be quite as accurate on a year-to-year -year basis, there's definitely some, some benefit to having just a very simple rule that everybody can just look at a simple table of numbers and see what the, what the result's going to be next year. I guess what would just the other the other follow up the concept that you mentioned, and and now that Steve's back, I think he'll probably want to comment on this as well. Is that you're quite right to point out that it makes a huge difference where you start. So when you go with a rule based on survey trend alone, what you're going to do is basically stabilize yourself where you are, and if that's a good place, then you've done a great job. In fact, if you if you choose to invoke that when you're right at MSY level, then you got it, you nailed it. But you don't learn about that in the process. So if you if you are lightly exploited and nowhere near MSY, you stabilize yourself right there and you stay there and you never know better. And if you're way down below MSY and the stock is producing only a quarter of the yield it should be, you stabilize it right there and you stay there when you go with a purely survey-based approach. And and so that's for fisheries that are using that, they've basically said, look, we don't care what the, what the true yield we might get out of this is we're just going to be happy with the yield we're getting right now and stick with it forever. And there's, there's pros and cons to both of those things. Yeah. So just to follow up on that, it, it seems like what we're doing now is kind of like that, that, oh, we're, we're above B30, uh, here's, the, here's the decision table, um, what's the probability ne in the next year or three that the stock is going to drop a certain amount? Oh, well, you know, we can live with that probability. And then we just take whatever we can take without trying to build the stock back up to the target that produces more yield in the long term. So do we know what BMSY is now, say? Well, we don't. And in fact, the current harvest policy isn't structured around the concept of BMSY. When they did the original simulations, they were, they were calculating what the yield could be, and they were trying to find a, a rule that would get you at least 80% of that yield, 80 or 90% of that yield, 80% of the time. And so it, was, it really was a probabilistic approach, just like we've been talking about here. But they didn't, they didn't actually provide estimates of what the, the MSY level would be. Um. Yeah. You just make a comment about rebuilding too, um, Ian, because it, it is actually, I think that's a very good point, Scott, about what is, what is the, uh, the harvest policy designed to do? Is it designed towards driving it towards a target? And, and right now, as Ian said, it's not. Uh, but if you had any thoughts on it based on your sort of rebuilding experiences in the Pacific Council? Well, the, this, the, the current harvest control rule is designed basically to keep us off that ramp. It's got a very steep ramp. I mean, a 30-20 policy is really steep. It means if you drop, if you're at 30, you fish at your, your F target. If you drop by just a few percent, if you get down to 25 percent, now you're only at half that target. And that's compared to other control rules. If you look at the North Pacific or the, the uh, Pacific Council down here on the West Coast, they use rules that are much, much flatter. So on, on the West Coast down here, they use a 40-10 so if you, if you drop 5% in spawning biomass, you don't drop nearly as much in, in your, the F level that you're applying. And 
but those policies are a little bit different. And to compensate for the fact that we have a very steep um, descending limb on that rule, the policy itself was designed with an, a fishing mortality target, point two, to keep us off that ramp most of the time. So that ramp was designed to be steep so that if the stock dropped, we'd get right back up above that target. But the, the F rate was designed to keep us away from that with a, with a high probability, whereas, say, on the West Coast down here, the 40-10 rule, the expectation is that they're going to be right at that inflection point most of the time, moving on to and off of that curve. And so the curve is fairly shallow, so there isn't a, bi a big abrupt change there. But th these are exactly the sorts of things that you can tune, and this is what, what Steve was illustrating with just what he did last night. You can tune that. You can tune the angle of those things and the F rate that you're applying, and you can see how it, it it changes the properties, and I think that's really that's really what what this this process is about. The, the current harvest control rule was developed focusing on the spawning biomass and the, the conservation objectives, but as you guys have have discovered or already knew and and have heard from Steve in the last day and a half, there's all these other objectives are important as well. When you start looking at the trade-offs in performance, every harvest control rule has those trade-offs built into it. And this is the chance to, to, to rethink some of those trade-offs because the, the current harvest control rule, that, that was never put out there for people to investigate and, and to think about, basically. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. I've got uh, Tom, Bruce, and Gary. <laughs> Tom Arkin. Ian, I'm just curious, has there been any consideration used uh, to use geometric means over, say, a two- or three-year period on... Uh, your survey data to smooth out any annual variations, and, and uh, maybe you could develop on the, you know, maybe the positive points. Because on a downswing, it might have you lagging behind, and so maybe you could. Uh, they, they've gone to that salmon now, and, and down in our area. But I'm just curious if you can maybe touch on that. I think you answered your own question there um, quite quite well, actually. We so we do actually use a smoothing method. We use a Kalman filter, which is basically just a fancy way of saying we use a three-year average on the survey, except it's not equal weight on the last three points. Most of the weight is on the last point in the survey series, and there's a little bit of weight on the second point and just a tiny little bit of weight on the third year back. And that, that was a process that, that Ray Webster investigated. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. Our, our endpoints don't bounce around that much. You can you can pretty much see the trend. But you, you're absolutely right that any time you put a smoother through there, you tend to lag behind the process. And so if the stock is going down and you're taking an average over the last few years, you're always going to be saying there's a little more than there actually is. And likewise, when the stock's going up, you're, you're going to be saying there's a little less than, than, than what you're seeing in the survey. So it's the trade-off between the variance in the survey itself and the fact that you don't want to be missing the, the actual trend that's going on. Yeah, it's quite right. Our survey, the, the Kalman filter is is weighted fairly heavily towards the most recent year, but in fact, um, the actual analysis itself could have said it could be even more highly weighted to more recent year, but because some areas, they don't, all the areas don't behave the same, we actually are using less than we, we might have got out of the analysis. The analysis was said basically the most recent year is your best fix on the population, uh, given the kind of sampling that we have for that much. Yeah, so, okay. Bruce. Yeah, Bruce Gabris. Just uh, wanted to comment on uh, Scott's discussion here about you know trying to rebuild stocks. I guess what I have a concern about is that you have an MSY level for um, a resource, whether it's a fishery or a game animal or whatever, um, and that's contingent upon the capacity and the ability of the ocean to carry that. So I guess if we start saying, well, let's cut back the harvest level to see whether or not we can have it will let the stocks rebuild to some previous level, how do we know that those stocks were at their peak at the time or not at their peak? So we may be chasing an objective that's just not possible or sustainable under a current regime. And, and uh, let's assume that the PDO correlation, as you said, Ian, I like that term, correlation, because we don't know if it causes it or not. But if the PDO correlation says that you know, we're just into a level where there's just going to be maybe smaller fish or fewer fish, it doesn't mean the stock's not healthy, but we could stop fishing, we probably wouldn't hit the same level of, of uh, resource that we had perhaps in the 80s. So um, 
I guess my point on that, I'm, I'm not interested in shutting down the fishery just to allow the fish in the water to see if we can get back to some other previous level. The 2030 or 3020 rule seems to be working to prevent us from going into that abyss side of it. And are we at the maximum? We don't know, but it's not a bad place to be. Uh, it seems to be working. Just, uh, I mean, I, that's a really important point, Bruce, and the it's related back to John's question about how stable is the B100 level, and I'm going to punt this softball right over to Ian because I know he's thought about it a lot. Actually, a lot of things you said, Bruce, are things that I said to the SRB a couple of weeks ago um, in that these, these quantities do change dramatically over time, and we don't want to end up in a situation where if you stopped fishing, you'd never get anywhere near your, your reference points. In fact, there's enough variability between good recruitment regimes and good size at age and poor recruitment regimes and poor size at age that if you're in a poor recruitment regime and you have poor size at age, you might not even be able to get to your SB 30% target if you were making that, if you were building that target off the good recruitment and good size at age regime. Now, the, the, the difficult factor here is that we don't know how, how correlated or how strongly the density dependence is for size at age. So when we look back in the, in the historical record, we see that during periods when recruitment was good, the size at age in the stock seems to have been poor. But what we really have is three data points. We have a period in the early part of last century when recruitment was low and size at age, sorry, re recruitment was good and size at age was low, and then we switched, and then it switched again. And obviously there's a transition in the middle in, in, in between each of those things. Recruitment turns around much more quickly than size at age. So recruitment turns around, you have a bit of a lag where you're still seeing the size at age associated with the other recruitment regime, and then eventually it catches up. But, you know, honestly, even with 100 years of data, we only have a sample size of about three. So to say for sure, is that going to move forward? Is, are we going to see the same thing in the future or not is, is, is difficult to know. What, what do you mean you have a sample size? So you're saying you have three correlation arrangements that you're saying that has patterned itself over the 100 years? Is that what you mean? That's what we have to work with, yes. Yeah, so we've seen, basically we've seen two good recruitment periods and two bad ones. And, 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 but the third bad one, or the second, the second poor recruitment regime, we don't, have, um, we don't have very good estimates on yet. So we really have up, down, up to compare to. And, and that, that tends to correspond to the trends in size at age. But as we've talked about over the last couple of days, there's some other factors that have, that have come into the story. It could be that in the past, the size at age of halibut was largely determined by the halibut stock. And it could be that now arrowtooth flounder and other flatfish species are, are playing a role in there. And, and that, that's something we don't know. We've got some ongoing research. We've got a big, big proposal and a big collaboration with National Marine Fisheries Service and University of Alaska to investigate this stuff a little further. But the reality is we're not quite sure why we're in the, the current phase we're in, which appears to be low recruitment and low size at age, and or whether that's going to last or whether this is just a transition. And now that we're in a low recruitment period, we should expect turnaround in size at age. That's, that's, that's an unknown yeah. or that, a known that, unknown. And that's the critical point about it is when you're, when you're developing the, the reference points for this is you essentially have to make an assumption or know which regime you're in to make the relevant reference points or else, as you said, Bruce, you're chasing a phantom uh, with, with the harvest control rules and the, and the whole harvest policy. But I would point out that we're, in, in this case, we're, we're talking about what's actually going on in the stock. If we, if we then step into the flight simulator that, that Steve's got for us, we can, we can look for policies that work in any of those scenarios. So we can look for a policy that says, look, we don't know what's going on with size at age or recruitment, and we could have periods of both up, both down, one up, one down, either direction. And we can look for harvest policies that are going to be that are going to perform well under any of those cases. And that's that's really the beauty of the MSE process is to be able to to investigate that, even though we don't know in reality what's going on. We can find a policy that'll get us through those things, regardless of of what the actual dynamics are assuming that we can come up with the right set of ground rules. And this is something John has brought up several times, which is that even the MSE process is only as good as the scenarios we put in it. So if we, if we, if we put those scenarios in and then we find out next year that it's actually 
you know, a disease outbreak that's causing size at age. Well, we didn't have that in the scenario, so obviously we didn't pick a policy that was robust to that. So it's, we're still only as good as the scenarios we can put in. But, you know, again, I think we can learn a lot from going back to the historical record and, and at least defining where we've been. Um, that's, and and that's, that's, that's a lot of the effort that I've spent this year is to try and open up our perspective a little bit and get back into the historical record. Thanks, Ian. Here you go, Gary and Jim. Yeah, Gary Robinson. Uh, uh, my question was with regard to this ramp we have from 30 to 20. Um, I think I agree with Bruce that I'm, I'm happy with 30, 30 20, but um, because we, we have no good reason to change it. But um, I, I take note that uh, when Steve drew this little graph on the board here, he's got another point called target where he says, I guess, you know, you don't want to be at 30 all the time, so you'd, you'd rather be at this target where you're 50% above and 50% below. Is there any precedent in any other fishery where you'd have a, a, a target point like that above which you would actually increase harvest rate? So I guess I'm asking, is there, does there have to only be one steepness to the ramp, or can you put another point in there where it, you know, is that something you want to build in this, into this simulator? Or are there actually fisheries that, that have that sort of adjustment? Yeah, there's a, a number of fisheries out there that have a similar sort of adjustment. I think in Alaska they have a 10% buffer on the OY or ABC, I, the acronyms I'm still learning. <laughs> um, I think Ian can probably name a few examples in the Pacific Fisheries Management Council as well. but. DFO has a similar sort of policy. They have these <clears throat> three different colored zones and they basically have this idea of a, of a target is where they kind of want to be half the time and then the threshold at which they start to do something is usually, you know, I believe in the current terms of reference for the DFO policy, Paul should know this by heart, um, is there's a, a limit reference point at 80% sorry, a threshold of 80% of BMSY and uh, a limit at 40% of BMSY. Am I correct, Paul? I'm becoming more and more Americanized here as I live down here. Yeah, that's my recollection as well. The only thing I would point out that those were, um, I would not call them generic targets, I guess, Gary, but they were um, uh, advice from science until further work was done for specific fisheries. Jim. I'm sorry. Oh, oh okay. Uh, I've got Chris Spore. <coughs> Chris Spore. Um, it sounds to me like everyone's sort of in agreement that we should try out B20 and B30 and see what happens, but I just remind everybody that before we say we're too happy with it, remember in the model that Dr. Martel showed us yesterday, when you look at B20, there's quite a few years there, especially when PDO's in place where the fishery's closed. So, um, you know, I think it's going to hinge on what are our other objectives and the likes, but I think what we're hearing from the group is that for, you know, what was objective two and three, we're, we're okay with keeping those in for now, and we might have to, based on our other objectives, tweak them somewhere down the road, maybe not. Okay, thanks, Chris. I just uh, point out that 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 was fishing at FMSY, I think, in, that, in those scenarios, isn't it? In your, uh... Yeah, but at this point, still. Right. Um, Chris's point's still valid. If you get a series of, of poor recruitment events and the stock does fall below that, um, you know, one of the rules that seemed to perform a little bit better than the 3020 rule was actually the 4010 rule which is we ramp down fishing mortality rate at B40 and we close the fishery at 10. And it basically makes that slope a little less steep, but you basically start taking precaution in the fishing mortality rates a little bit earlier than you would uh, if you were at the, using the 30-20 rule. It's like in comparison to running down a gentle slope versus running down a steep cliff. I think the other thing maybe we should build into this, Steve, is the uh, ability to control the fishing mortality rate on this too is another another tuning factor, yeah. which so we could play with the target harvest rate then.
<laughs> didn't have my mic on. Um, I think we have general agreement on on the control rule or the uh, 3020 control rule with some modifications and potentially controlling the harvest rate as well. Uh, what we also want to look at is uh, what sort of performance metrics are you interested in looking at here? Steve has outlined a number of them in his in his evaluation tool here. Uh, are there some other ones that are that are meaningful to you that you'd like to see built into this? Jim Lane, uh, just just clarification. Uh, you, yesterday afternoon, we talked about putting some ceiling on the catch ceiling when we start running these operating models, so we don't see a 200, 200 million pound harvest at one point in time. That's 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 the understanding. There's going to be some bounds on the upper end based on some historical type of what we based on the information that we have in the past about sort of the upper limit of harvests. That's something we can put into it, Jim, yeah. Because then that would that could change, you know, what the perceived the uh, how well some of these work if you have basically what what the upper bound is probably pretty easy to define at the current state of capacity. It, the processors could probably tell you themselves that I can only process in a given season X million pounds of, of halibut, um, and that might be one means of defining an upper bound. There's also uh, capacity in the fishing fleet. You know, if there's a latent effort out there, i.e., the fish are tied up at the docks, uh, then then you could see that it could be easily to achieve easy to achieve, you know, an upper bound, but whether that number is 100 million pounds, 150 million pounds, 200 million pounds, I have no idea. At some point, the price is going to, the, the markets just aren't going to take that much fish either. So, but you never know. Any thoughts from uh, John or Brad on it? Hmm. Well, I guess John Woodruff here, I, I guess uh, he'd like to see what happens. <laughs> That's the short answer. The, uh, but, I mean, yeah, I'd like to see us get to some number that's, that's uh, well above where we've been. I mean, we've been, I think we harvested uh, 73 million pounds uh, 15 years ago, and there was certainly market acceptance for that. Uh, there'd be a whole bunch of issues, but I think, I think you'd find a ready market for whatever you pulled out of the water. I mean, the question, of course, is then what's the price, but I think you'd find a ready market for whatever you pull out of the water. Yeah, I would agree. I think there would be a large price disruption for a year or two, but I think the market could, could handle over time easily 50 or 75 million pounds again. Okay, thank you. Bruce? Yeah, it's Bruce Gabris. Yeah, my thoughts on that yesterday when we discussed it uh, was that I would uh, I would disagree with putting an upper bound on there for some you know, some artificial upper bound um, for those reasons that John's and the other process have mentioned that the market has the ability to absorb that. And Steve, you'd mentioned about you know there's there's a and theoretically there's this capacity issue at some point in time if the fish just magically tripled. You know, you wouldn't be able to harvest it, or or a processor wouldn't be able to process it. Just want to make sure that that we appreciate the fact that uh, capacity is a function of economics. And uh, anytime a processor, or a fisherman says they can't do more, they can, given time to adjust and the, an appro appropriate incentive financially to adjust. So, I would be um, I would not be inclined to put some kind of an upper cap on it. Um, for any of those other marketing reasons, and um, biologically, if the regime would shift that it could support a 150 million harvest, then that was biologically safe. Bring it on. Thank you, Dan, and then Scott. I would just note I, that um, the, the chances of getting close to an upper cap anytime <laughs> soon are are so so low that uh, it might not be worth. Uh, <laughs> too much to worry about either whether it's in or out of the, the analysis, but um, but more importantly that any uh, 
reference data from the past on what was a perceived cap really is, I don't believe, would be applicable in the future because, for example, there are a number of other uh, user groups who um, sport, sport fish, recreational fish users who have been uh, over time harvesting more and so um, that plus the fact that the you know, world's population is growing, the need for protein is, uh, is not decreasing. So uh, those, those past uh, empirical data on, um, on, on limits is, I don't think yeah. are really um, applicable to a future situation. Yeah, I think that's a very good point about um, the expansion of other user sectors in this thing, including as Steve just mentioned, Domino's, Halibut Pizza. So, <laughs> well, I like the idea of having the uh, population sh shoot through the roof. I've been hearing a lot of people say they're looking for stability from year to year in the catch limits. And Chris mentioned that perhaps a 15% uh, change from year to year. And I'm curious, Steve, if you can put into the model uh, blank fields where we can fool around with that 15%, see if 20%, 10% in both directions to see how that will play out for us so we can get a better idea. Yeah. Sorry, Steve Martel. While we were sitting here, I just added in another catch floor just to show you how that the probabilities of achieving, achieving your objectives change when you lower the floor from 90 to 70 in probably another 20 minutes, I could do the same thing with an alternative percentage. So, but the idea there is that there'll be a harvest rule or a suite of tools on that website interface where you'll have a drop-down box where you can choose your limit to be 0 0.2, 0 0.1, or and your t threshold to be you know 0.3 or 0.4, and your target to be 0.4 or 0.5, whatever it is, and all of those scenarios will be will have been run in the background and then you can just click on the one you want to see or your favorite policy and then uh, maybe get become infamous like Chris does. <laughs> that would be great, thank you. Bruce? You know, we, we keep toying with this 15% uh, up and down and that's a great, I think that has a great potential for providing stability, but um, if the information is available it takes generally five years or less to go from 10 million pounds to 20 million if you limit it to 15 percent a year and conversely it takes slightly less than five years to go from 10 million to 5 million on the downside. Of the stocks over the last hundred years or so, when have we had time periods where we've doubled the stocks or cut the stocks more than 100 percent within any time, five year time frame? Because you know that's that's the limiting factor. It's a governor, if you will, that 15 percent. I don't know. We may have never hit a period where we've doubled or half the stock within five years. And in that case, that 15 percent rule may not be so unreasonable. That may be pretty practical. I don't think that's happened happened coastwide, but by regulatory area, I think it has happened. Uh, maybe not 100 percent, but certainly close to 50 percent. I I think we need to be careful too about when we're talking about catch limits versus biomass because they're totally different things and we've had some significant changes in catch limits which haven't necessarily meant that the number of fish in the water has changed very much. It's our, it's our assessment of how much fish is in the water and so we have had some significant changes in catch limits um, and it's because our assessment of the biomass has changed but the number of fish in the water hasn't changed. But under that scenario had we had a 15% change rule, would we have not have saved ourselves from ourselves, you know, in that process, you know, because we've made some pretty, I mean, there's some particular painful years where, where uh, harvest uh, uh, catch, uh, allowable catch has gone way up and then conversely way down or vice versa that from year to year. So it would be a governor that would take out some of that. So it's pretty, actually, that's a pretty good stability rule. Now, whether 15% is the right number, um, I don't know, but... I would like to just at least look at that from a historical perspective. How many times would have that have changed the end result in what we have done for any five-year period um, over that? So uh, we could definitely look at that on a year-by-year on a -year basis. There was a period um, in the late 1970s or in the mid-1970s when the catch came down at much greater than 15% per year. 
and then subsequently in the early 80s it went back up at I think much greater than 15 percent per year so that we definitely there was a period that that particular period stands out I could certainly make these calculations both at a coastwide level and, and area by area well I, I'm not suggesting that year by year looking at 15 percent but my focus would be is for simple simplifying the math it takes five years under 15 percent rule it takes you five years to double the size of your harvest you know capability just by doing the math and it takes you just a little less than five years to half it so it would be five year periods when have we changed for any five year period where we have doubled the amount or have decreased it by uh, you know by that same by half uh, that that's kind of what I was getting at I think that's a reasonable point Bruce I, I draw us back to the discussion we had a little bit earlier about um, that 15 percent rule is as long with some other rules is sensitive to your starting point on things in terms of what how it performs for you it depends on where you are where the biomass is to start with on that you can introduce some really dangerous lags into the into the system if you're particularly at very low stock levels so anyway pair uh, yeah Bruce you kind of stole my thunder on that on the starting point <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, personally I'm willing to sacrifice a lot of upside for, for stability I think uh, and a lot of members of my group are willing to sacrifice a certain amount of upside for, you know, a stable fishery that you can count on and, uh, you know, have stable markets. I guess that's to John then. Well, I guess my um, challenge with the 15% rule is just if it's applied area by area, I mean, I just think there have been too many times when, especially in areas with smaller quotas, smaller GHLs, um, you know, 15% is not a huge number. So uh, I guess uh, I guess I'd want to be thinking hard about how that 15% 15 applies. If it applies to the entire bio, uh, you know, entire quota, maybe that's one thing. But if it applied area by area, um, I think that would be challenging for an area, for example, like 2C. Uh, either up or down. And I get the stability part. Uh, I think that's a worthy, certainly a worthy goal, but I just, uh, in areas that have smaller quotas, I think 15% could be huge. I mean, we might find that very encumbering, um, like 4B. Um, it's not a whole bunch. Thanks, John. That's a reasonable point. I, and it, it also touches on one of the fundamental issues in, that we've sort of gone around here is the fact that we don't have reference points on an area specific basis. We're still dealing with reference points at a coastwide basis. Um, and our, our longer term goal is to try to build some of that uh, spatial structure into our assessment model in the harvest policy. But right now we don't have that at an area specific level. So we need to be, the control rules and the harvest policy needs to be sensitive to that, that uh, lack of uh, dimensionality with it, if you will. So, Chris. Uh, Chris for just on this 15% there, there seems to be some interest in exploring it or something similar to it so I guess can we build the flight simulator the our, our new video game or whatever we're going to call it here um, <clears throat> so that we could you know say let's try 15% up 20% down or 20% up 15% down like again just running different scenarios is it possible to have that kind of flexibility uh, and then I'm obviously there is interest coastwide versus area, but um, that's a whole other set of fun. Um, but I just think you know maybe that's a way that then we can uh, it just allows us to look at different scenarios because as people said, I don't know if fifteen percent is the right number. Is it is it right both ways? I, I don't know. Like when we talked about it, well, it's more than ten and less than twenty. You know, I mean, that's kind of how we got at it. So anyway, I just comment on that. Yeah, Scott Meyer. Um, I was wondering, Steve, could you explain to everyone how you implemented the control rule in the simulation? Because you told me yesterday, and, and um, I thought about it some more, and I still don't understand. Um, you you took whatever the harvest was last year, and then you made a decision to either increase the catch 15% or decrease it. Did you go all the way, or did you? I can't remember how you impl how you actually apply that rule. So the rule is the exact same rule as a fixed harvest rate rule. So if 
if you predict next year's biomass and you calculate the TAC based on the fishing mortality rate times the biomass, and then you look at that TAC and say it's 130, but last year's catch was only 100, then I would set this year's catch at 115 and vice versa if it went down, I'd only allow it to go down by 15%. So it was a fixed harvest rate rule. Uh, one of the features of the rule that I think people found attractive was A, the fishery never closed, and that's just because it's a fixed harvest rate rule. Um, we've had the rule that Chris just suggested in the past, we, we've had that it's a slow up fast down, uh, or slow up fall down, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> the, um, the policy there, you can, you know, have two levels on top of these things, and that's kind of what we do at the the Fisheries Council SSC levels. Anyways, I know the, in the Alaska system we have these uh, plan teams that sit down and determine what the the ABC should be, and we usually apply it just by default a 10% buffer, and then the council will usually accept it or, or add even more buffer to it for other reasons. So. Um, yeah, there's no reason not having a, a multiple or two-stage uh, approach to the harvest control rule. Got uh, Bruce and then Gary, and then I'd like to take a break. <laughs> But, okay, sorry. No, Chris, when uh, we're talking about the 15 percent, and, and I, I guess, when I, and I hear the discussion about that. Um, I personally was pretty partial to the the fast down, slow up rule, which is basically just a variation of, of a hard rule that says 15 percent, because it gives you more flexibility. And then the lag, Bruce, that you mentioned, you know, the, the risk of the lag, you kind of you, you minimize that risk by saying we can go fast down but it does still smooth that, that trend for the stability-wise. So uh, what's the, I mean, I guess the, uh, the slow up, fast down kind of died. Uh, I mean, what is the status of that? Or is there a chance that that might be resurrected as an alternative, a modified alternative to the 15% rule? All of those things, Bruce, can be incorporated into it if you, if you want to look at that, that kind of control rule for it, the, the sort of um, long, sad litany of <laughs> slow up fast down as it was slow up slow up fast down and then it was slow up full down uh, as we realized that we were chasing a falling star and just not not catching it uh, and that was an important issue uh, and when we went to the decision table that whole thing comes out of it because we're looking at then just serious making, making policy decisions based on sort of probabilities of, of risk uh, Yeah, my, Gary Robinson speaking. Uh, my question is about this uh, theft or no theft parameter you've got in there. Is that um, a specified size of theft, and is it a, is it a one-time theft, and uh, ca can you make it such that we can simulate ongoing theft? Yeah, I know how much was taken, but you don't. <laughs> and And that's essentially the point, is that we really don't, or, or at least as suspect, you know, we have a, a new observer program and, and we may be getting better data out of that or, or biased data that's precisely biased or whatever it is. That is precisely the point is that you really don't know uh, how much theft's going on. I chose a value that, that made it look pretty extreme. And the irony of, of it is that when you include the, the theft in the simulations, you actually, especially in the PDO cycle, and in both procedures, both scenarios actually, you actually get better performance out of the stock assessment model. And the reason is, is you're generating more contrast in the data. If you have this stationary stock recruitment relationship and you you're able to get enough data to figure out what MSY is, and then you just keep trucking along for 35 years. You've you've got no contrast in the assessment model, so the assessment can, in theory, actually get worse over time just because of the the confounding and accumulation of, of observation errors. But the the theft part, you actually get slightly better performance in in the precision of the the stock assessment model. Um, 
Yeah, you can turn those switches on or off. You could play alternative hypotheses and, and say that the black catch in the golf is, is 1x, 2x, 3x, and just look what happens. You could do the same thing in the stock assessment model, too, and ask how that impacts the stock assessment. Generally, it's a scaling problem. So, so if I tick that box or choose that scenario, then uh, that, that's an ongoing thing, though, from year to year, right? Okay. Although I think it's important to clarify that it didn't apply to the historical period in your simulation, and that would be, in terms of an analogy to anything that would occur in reality, this, the scenario that Steve has developed is as if it had never happened in the past and all of a sudden it started happening. So that, that may or may not correspond to a scenario anybody's thinking about. And, and had it had been happening in the past and we just did the stock assessment as with the catch data as is, we were, our assessment model, our operating model, and everything would already be biased associated with those thefts that were occurring. The point is, is that it was like the cartoon. When you have a crisis, how do you deal with it? Well, you got to plan for it. And, and so putting those things uh, in, in place, you want to plan for it. All right, I'd like to take uh, a quick break here if we can go back at quarter 11 and talk about uh, sort of what kind of products we're looking for in the timelines uh, about which what we can do in this and this is going to be critically dependent on our ability to build the realistic Halibut model that's in behind this thing so that when you start doing these examinations it has real meaning for us so okay back at quarter to 11 <laughs>
Okay, can we come back to session, please? <laughs> Okay, what I'd like to just touch on now is um, a little bit on reestablishing exactly where we are. I'm going to ask Ian a, a couple of questions about uh, performance metrics in terms of the decision table and things on that, and I'm going to then talk to, uh, have Steve talk a little bit about what sort of our expectations were in terms of going forward with a true halibut-based model as opposed to the simulation exercise that, that you've just been going through for the last day or so. Sorry, Ian. Yeah. I just before we get started on new topics, I did want to follow up on Bruce's question. Okay. So maybe when you get to that point, I, sure. I can okay. do that. So um, one of the things that uh, we want to make sure everybody's understanding is this whole process that we've gone through for the last day or so is to get you used to working with a tool that allows you to look at some of the control rules and how they actually work, but reminding you that this is just strictly a textbook simulation thing going on in the background there where we want to be going is to actually get halibut data in front of you. Um, I want to revisit the, uh, the objectives that we had identified here and, and, and be clear on which ones we're going to be addressing as we go forward from this, but Ian, go ahead with a response. So I think, I think Bruce raised a really interesting question earlier, which is how does 15% uh, change in the fishery landings compare to what we've actually seen over the historical record? So I pulled up the landings and I just looked at it at a coastwide basis, but I pulled up the, land, the fishery landings from 1935 to 2012, so we've got a 78-year record to, to look over, to ask the question, how many times have we changed, have the landings changed by more than 15% during that time period? And it turns out that it's been 19 times over that, that period that we've had a greater than 15% change, which I was actually kind of surprised about. I, I expected a period in the, in the 70s and 80s with, with some pretty rapid change. Uh, but it turns out basically one out of every four years has been greater than a 15% change. So uh, the, the Sporer rule, um, it actually is a pretty, pretty heavy constraint on the rate of change relative to what we've actually seen in the fishery. As I pointed out, most of that, uh, most of that change, or many of those years, were in the early 1970s as the, as the landings came down, and then in the early 1980s as they came back up again. In fact, we had one period there where we had uh, seven out of ten years in a row where the, the catch changed on, in the downward direction by, by greater than 15 percent. If, if the, the second part of the question Bruce asked was um, looking over a five-year period, because with the 15 percent rule, you shouldn't see a change of more than about 50 percent over any cumulative five-year period. And it turns out we still have 13, 13 years over that 78-year record when the change relative to five years previously was at least 15 percent. So that's, that's almost 20 percent, almost one out of five years where the change relative to where the, where the landings were five years ago was um, greater than you, you, could, you could achieve with the 15 percent per year. So a little historical perspective on that one. Uh, thank you, Ian. This is Bruce Gabers for doing that. And uh, actually, uh, during in the break, Ian showed me those numbers, and uh, somewhat surprising that is, and that, and I think uh, because of the uh, the frequency which that had happened, which was not intuitive from my what I would have thought just by thinking back over the last 30 years that I've been fishing, uh, is that uh, some of the enthusiasm for doing a 15% rule would seem to be waning for that, and uh, that's why I was appreciative of sharing that with the rest of us because that may have a little bit different thought process on it that it actually was that volatile during that time period. Thanks, Bruce, and I think this this reinforces the idea of what we're looking at. We've been looking at sort of a simulation type of process here, and we need we need to relate this back to halibut data, and that's where these these issues come to the fore. Um, getting back to the uh, objectives that we're going to be looking at over the next while, I wanted to actually make them more concrete in terms of what we had identified in the the previous um, meeting in in this last couple of days. Essentially, what we're going to be looking at is objectives two, three, and variations on objective six. Um, ultimately, 
we want to be looking at objective five, but we're a ways away from the sort of spatial component that we want to do on this. But as we looked at, at this and talked around the issue, I think we also want to add a, a variant or a, a flexibility around objective one um, as another objective for us to be evaluating with the various um, tools we have available. Um, I think what I, I would like to ask um, two questions, the first one of Ian and then secondly of, of Steve in terms of the model, but Ian, in terms of uh, performance metrics that may be relevant to the decision table, do you have anything new or some request that we need to put into this that, that seems that's occurred to you over the last couple of days? Well, it's not really my place to suggest what they should be, um, but uh, I, I and I and I haven't we haven't had a lot of feedback on the, the the columns since the period between the interim meeting and the annual meeting last year. I guess the point that I, I think are worth considering is we used we had two different metrics with regard to the the rate of change in spawning biomass and the rate of change in the, the fishery CEY for spawning biomass. I reported what's the probability the spawning biomass is going to go down one year out, and then what's the probability it's going to go down by at least 5%. For the fishery CEY, I had what's the probability it's going to go down, what's the probability it's going to go down by at least 10%. And that 5 and 10% were requested, um, but I guess I, I would I'd throw out to you guys, are those the right, the right percentages to use for those two, two quantities? Um, remembering that the idea of the decision table is it should be simple enough that people can digest it. If I just put a hundred columns in there, no one's going to bother to read any of them. So I really need to keep it to a pretty limited number of things that are, are really key quantities. But um, So those, those two percentages were useful. The other, the other issue that came up, and I throw it out there for you guys to think about, is that you noticed in last year's decision table that we had a column which is what's the probability that the stock drops below SB 20 percent? And it was a pretty boring column because I think all the percentages in there were 1 percent or less than 3 or 4 percent. And my rationale for including that column anyway is to try and provide some stability in the decision table itself, realizing that it may not be very interesting this year, but there may be a point in the future when there's action in that column that we need to to take consideration of, and rather than adding and subtracting columns from the table every year and having everybody, you know, how come you took that one out and how come you put this one in, trying to find a set of performance metrics that work really generally across all cases. So I guess I would, I would seed your, your thinking on this by saying think about performance metrics that are going to be useful over a broad spectrum of ups and downs and, and good and bad performance. Yeah, uh, Paul Ryle. So, um, to answer your question, Ian, I think it was a question. Um, I guess I would not expect to see a re really high probability in that column, and uh, I would hope any of those uh, measures that we're looking at would uh, would confirm that, and so that we wouldn't be anywhere near that. And so, while it might just seem like, oh, what's the big deal about seeing one percent in that column? Um, I find some comfort in that that we're not actually getting anywhere near that. So. Um, well, so to me, I guess it is a help uh, just to make to confirm that. Um, and if I actually saw some really high number there, that I think that would be some cause for concern and uh, be thinking about, well, that's not really where I want to go. Um, I had a question around just where we were at. I guess uh, Bruce, and just going through this, you were proposing that to take a look at the objectives, and you said two, two and three and six is kind of where you'd focus initially. Yeah, and I guess I had a question about number one. Like we, had, I thought we had talked yesterday about number one is not particularly being um, necessary. And if we were trying to reduce it, I, the question I would have is, what would number one add in addition to two and three? And when I look at number one, at least the way it's currently um, constructed, it has a probability of uh, 0.99, which uh, is quite large, um, and really. Depending on what you pick that num minimum number, uh, you can make that uh, number one relevant or not relevant. And so, I get, going back to my question, what would it what would it add uh, in addition to two and three? And I so um, <clears throat> I'm going to try and tackle that 
I drew something on the board while there was another conversation going on, and I think it's relevant to your question, Paul. If we did, in fact, produce a, a, or select a, a management procedure that has some sort of catch floor associated with it, uh, if you look at what I drew on the board, if you look at what I drew on the board, was we typically have these harvest control rules where at 20% we shut down the fishery. Well, if we have this catch floor going on like this, then the actual fishing mortality rate by imposing this constant catch increases exponentially as the stock gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So if, if objective one specifies some minimum biomass and we do allow this sort of buffer zone to, to occur, uh, then having something like objective one put in place, but this only applies if, if you have a, a catch policy that doesn't shut down the fishery if the stock falls below the limit. So that's that, that would be the only application I could see uh, of having such a, a strict, hard conservation limit. And maybe Ian can add to that. Yeah, Paul Ryle again. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. That's an interesting explanation. I hadn't thought of that. Um, so what would be the rationale for having that kind of uh, catch floor in place? What were you thinking of as a rationale? I mean, I can see test fisheries being one example where we'd like to collect information that has some impact. Um, I don't know what the catch numbers are at this point in time that come out of the test fishery. They're not particularly large. So that could be one. Um, were you thinking of others? Well, I was thinking if the the directed fishery was closed, we still have other users of the halibut resource out there. Yeah. And um, it, you know, if if the stock does fall below that limit, then all of a sudden, you know, the councils are going to have to start dealing with uh, a real halibut conservation issue associated with with non-target fisheries. Well, this is a follow-up to that. If we would keep this in, then that quote, the, 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 the quotation and the parentheses there, it says level to be determined, that's probably going to be the relevant part of this discussion because Ian mentioned yesterday that currently we're talking about 10 million female spawner or 10 million spawners that are available and the suggestion in the original draft was a million. That obviously, I don't think anybody around this table would say we can whack the other 9 million right now and still be okay. Uh, so if that becomes 3 million or 5 million, then that might be relevant and might be, a, a, I'm not going to use the term problematic, but it might be something that's not benign. Excuse me, yeah, Adam. <laughs> Adam Geiser. So if we have the hierarchy of objectives, though, and like objective number two is the first objective that needs to be met, then would we still be in? The, we wouldn't still be in the scenario, though, would we? Even with the constant catch floor. Yeah. Great point, Adam. We, uh, we can change that and make that objective three, and and have objective one being the twenty percent, the thirty percent, and then you know if we can't satisfy those objectives, but any policy that you know is going to have a probability of one, I, we never want to go there. That's usually one of your highest priorities. Adam Kaiser again. So I was thinking if, if the objective number one, the million mature females, if that isn't an objective and we switched two and three in hierarchy, then there would there would be no loss of not having objective number one. Right? Yeah, that's what I was just asking Steve about and he made that point is that if you use it as a control point, it essentially has a probability of one. So. Okay. Um, any other comments on that, or right, Chris? Um, <clears throat> yeah, just a one question, sort of. I guess <clears throat> one thing we I don't think we have is is um, you know we've got objectives two and three, and are and so as we're are we saying we're trying to hang around B thirty, which I think is kind of risky to be there. Like we haven't sort of said like what's the what's the B target, if you will. We we haven't really addressed that. We've talked a little bit about this. 15% or 20%, the stability part of it, we have really haven't kind of 
framed anything around you know is it b40 is that it, or or what kind of target do we think we'd like to be working around because as it stands it's, it's almost like we're working around b30 and i don't think that's a place we want to hang out yeah we we haven't specified uh, we've specified a, a limit and a threshold but we haven't specified in the objectives a target where we would like to be, say, 50% of the time. And that may be something you wish to add to the objectives uh, and give yourself that small little buffer. Like I said, if, if the threshold becomes your target, you're going to be you know, falling off the hill half the time and, and then always trying to climb back up again, um, like my daughter does. So, yeah, the departure on, on uh, from our present policy is that we're, we're using a probabilistic um, determination around B30 not, as, not as, a, as a target to be there. We're trying to be above that most of the time and that's why the, the F level that was chosen was below what FMSMI might be. But I think if you want to have a target in there then we, we can do that. Um, I, I think we probably should make that a flexible, uh, flexible target so that you can examine that uh, range of them. If we did that, would that become the MSY? No. No, that would just be a target. <laughs> you, you could make MSY as one of the targets, which is generally a, a little more perilous place to be in fisheries management, but yeah, but you could make it one. So I guess, do we want to have a target? I think, I, I, I know... I know I would like to see it and you know play around with you know Bruce said the flexibility of that whether it's 0 0.4, 0 0.35, whatever that could be. Are we in agreement for that as adding an objective? Uh, just I want to go, uh, John Woodruff. So um, I guess I'm I'm just again struggling a little bit about. I have no problem with 30, 20. Um, I think that's we, we need some of those um, um, limits. Uh, but what I am wondering about is what happens when you get to a situation. I realize this is a moving target to some degree because as our as the ecological situation changes, so does you know what happens with the biomass. But um, what I'm wondering is what happens when in area two you have what looks like a robust, a healthy resource because your CPUEs have gone up above 300 pounds per skate and yet out west you don't. If you're looking at it from a coastwide standpoint, um, you know, how does that, I, my question really is just how does that all interact and what ends up happening because there could be some very disappointed people if you had this goal set and uh, suddenly you didn't go fishing in in some areas that look a lot more robust than others. I mean, there's as you know better than me. There's a huge geographical uh, area here, and you could you could be suffering west of Kodiak and and actually maybe doing much better eastward. That's a really good point, John, and and uh, we've been talking about that as as one of the necessary components in the operating model is a spatial component. Um, and I, well, I think we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes about uh, what that issue is. So, uh, um, I think it would be a good idea, from my point of view, to have a, a target as uh, part of the objective setting. Um, don't know what that level would be or whether it would be 50%, but I think the idea of um, you know not making the 30% the target in effect and then being heading in that direction then going, oh, we don't want to be there. We want to get away from here. Uh, thanks, Dan Hall. And I agree. I, th I think that for, for purposes of, uh, of analysis or assessment, we're exploring the range of possibility and, um, and what the consequences would be on a, a range of 35 to 40 percent off initially sounds like a, a good range to consider. Yeah, Jim Lane. Yeah, just remember this is we're just simulating stuff here. 
right? So we're not saying this is going to happen. We're saying what is, if you do this, it's just a simulation, so we're not saying yeah, we're going to go there because, you know, that, let's see how that works as, it, as, a suite of, as one of our suite of objectives. So we're just trying it out. Adam Kaiser. Um, it's a good point that we should think of a range of targets. But it, was that what you were meaning, Bruce, when you talked about a, a flexible target? Yes. Okay. Yes. I don't know if there is some yeah. magical flexible target range. You're also talking about <laughs> no, no. Okay, thanks. Peggy. I think I'd be in fa uh, Peggy Parker, I'm with Hannah. I'd be in favor of uh, playing with that idea, too, and then thinking also about how it will translate into area by area, uh, you know, following that through to make sure that we can either prove or disprove what um, what John was saying earlier. Thank you. And that's, I'm sorry, Dan? I just would add one point that <clears throat> and in the in the process of doing this, it would highlight the issue of a transition what, to, to using something like a target, if that's in eventually the way we would want to go. Have, using a, a target rate that might be or target amount that might be higher than what the what B30 is and what the difference is in transitioning um, in different scenarios. Right. Thank you. Okay. I think um, I'm sorry, Bruce. Yeah. Just um, um, back to number one. I mean, we kind of drifted into the next one, but I'm not sure in my own mind. Do we see that there's a need for objective one, or to change the amount of objective one, or I mean, I'm not sure if that's alive and well still in the mix now or if it's dead and gone. It, it, is, it ends up being uh, redundant if you're satisfying two and three, uh, then one uh, is automatically. Yeah, I, I guess that was the yeah. point. So does that mean that one, we just, is that the consensus? I mean, I, I'd like to have to get on the record that we're killing number one. <laughs> no, or we're not killing number one. The point I was making is that we do <laughs> Point, sorry, Steve Martel here. The point I was making is if you do decide to put in a minimum catch floor, then as the stock falls below 20%, the exploitation rate keeps going up. And at some point, you've got to say, uh, you've got to stop fishing here or, or you're going to surpass objective one. Can I rephrase my question? Consensus sure. as a group is number one, in or out? I think what Steve's pointing out is that because you have other users in here that you, you even if you shut the directed fishery, you still may have some other removals, and that's going to be relevant to this. So in that sense, it would be in still. So. Yeah, um, I must admit yesterday I was not particularly attracted to number one, but with Steve's uh, explanation about a floor, um, I'm not still particularly attracted to number one, but I'd like to better under, understand uh, the value of it. And so rather than making a hard decision today about whether it's in or out, I'd like to better understand some of the implications before making a final decision would be my view. Um, I, I kind of have a feeling that it's redundant, but I think we should, I'd like to explore this concept of what does it mean if there was a floor? I mean, I gave the example around the test fishery. You gave another around um, catch and other fisheries. Like if, okay, if that was going on, we don't want to go below. Um, so I'd like to understand what that means. And um, by way of an example, um, I can think of some uh, decision rules that we have in fisheries within Canada now that do have a floor. Um, and uh, so we, got, we have a basically what Steve did uh, draw, draw up here. I think, Paul, we get that when you're talking about understanding the implications. You get that, but through that examination of, of the simulation exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Spore, <clears throat> I, I, I was on the Crossing 1.0 page, and I think I still am, but I, I think I, I don't quite understand the, you know, Dr. Martell has mentioned uh, a rationale for putting it, and I haven't grasped it yet, so I don't know if do we want to spend time talking about what that now or at some point in the future um, 
because it seems to be something that's resonating uh, that we there is rationale for keeping it in, but I don't I don't understand the implicate the rationale like the why. I actually default to Paul's earlier comment. I, I think it's something that we could put in there because if you really do put a choose a management procedure that does have the floor. There is this pathological effect. If the stock falls below 20 percent, then the, the further it falls, the more intense the fishing pressure becomes. Moreover, it, it could be the stock does fall below 20 percent, and uh, the directed fishery gets shut down, yet the bycatch fisheries, subsistence fisheries, and other fisheries that are still legally allowed to, to take halibut uh, can do so potentially and never allow the stock to recover. So at some point, I think if, if we explore this policy, this rationale, if, if we get to that point in, in these harvest control rules, then uh, it should be on the table. But it is redundant in the sense that it, as long as we're choosing management procedures that, that satisfy the other two objectives, conservation objectives, uh, it's not a, it's nothing that's really going to trip the fire bell for the directed fishery. Pick. Well, I'm glad people are thinking about a reference. I, I mentioned it a long time ago <clears throat> with another flawed idea, which was chasing the WPUE. But um, the reason I mentioned the reference was that you could get benefits out of fishing around a different biomass level than being just above the ramp. And, and I know people were reluctant to specify any absolute fishery objectives yesterday, but so if we're going to have a, um, <clears throat> some kind of a target level that we're going to aim for, then uh, maybe I missed it, but we should put some a period, and like Dan kind of alluded to that, that there would be, if we're below that target level now, that there would be some phase-in period that we, you know, want to be reach that level within a certain number of years, and then you need some kind of percentage or or probability around it too. Steve was pointing out essentially what you're looking at is a, re is a rebuilding plan to that target, and that's that's something to keep in mind that when you adopt a target, then you're actually invoking a whole bunch of machinery that says, okay, we have to get to that target. And there, and it it comes back to the issue uh, as well as when we define that target, it's contextual in terms of the sort of dynamics you're under at that time, and it has the same kind of issues about trying to use reference points that are inappropriate when you go through a regime shift or something. So that's worthwhile keeping in mind on that, Scott. Peggy Parker with Hannah. Um, I wanted a clarification on what the current situation is with that 2030 management tool um, with regard to the other sectors. So if we were to reach the 20 percent, the directed fishery would be closed down, all other fisheries would be open? That's a very good question, Peggy, and in the case of 2A and 2B, where you have a combined catch limit assigned for it and you have an allocation framework, then that affects all users in that because the, the combined catch limit affects those users. Um, in any area where you have a catch allocation plan, it affects the users that are involved in the catch allocation plan and not those who are not. So in the case of uh, 2B and 2A, it affects all removals other than than uh, bycatch in the case of two, in the case of Alaska, even with the catch sharing plan, should it be adopted, you still have the unguided sector that doesn't come under the catch sharing plan, so they would not be affected by that control rule. And the, and the trawlers, exactly. And subsistence. Yeah. Sorry, my question is related to, to Peggy. Is I, I don't, still don't understand how or if objective one and two would have different effects on different sectors. Like there, is, there was a comment earlier about on the directed or non-directed fisheries. I get it. Um, if we got to 20% uh, of SSB, um, the, where, like you said, where there's an allocation plan in place or an allocation agreement in place, the fishery would shut down. It would 
also happen at, with the first objective if we got to that threshold? It wouldn't be any different for directed or non-directed fisheries, right? I think in the case of um, if you're using it as a control rule in there, to the extent that the uh, regulations affect all users, um, it, it would affect those that, that are governed by the regulations. You know? So if we have, and that's the commission's option as to how much they want to include in that, but if, for example, the commission doesn't have any control over bycatch, then it doesn't control that. So then I still think that objective, the first objective is, is that, that there's no need for it. That is completely redundant. Just as long as you're staying above 20% of SSB, the fishery is shut down. So, the, how, like, how would the first objective? The, the governed fisheries are shut down, but right. the, but the ungoverned fisheries are not. But the the so that that makes sense. But for the first objective, that wouldn't shut down the ungoverned fishery fisheries, would it? No. So then, no. what's the point of yeah. having the first objective? So the floor option that, that Dr. Martel brought up would apply in either case or any case. We could establish a floor no matter what other objectives we decide on. The floor is independent. The floor idea is independent of the objectives that are listed here. I, I, I just sort of introduce a, a procedural point here: is that the the commission's um, rulemaking authority is um, is not unfettered. <laughs> it it, it uh, is dependent on acceptance by the two governments. Uh, but the commission could make a recommendation to the two governments about control of all fisheries, um, and that would get at the issue of here. But I think from the perspective of examining the impact of that and informing the, the commission about how they might make that decision or whether they would consider that decision, we probably should have this as part of the evaluation framework. Scott, um, something you said there was a kind of on a triggered back to comments I made at the beginning of the meeting about terminology and when we talk about directed fisheries, what's included and what isn't included. And it, it sounded like the first explanation you gave that you would still have unguided sport and subsistence fisheries happening, but because they're not part of the catch sharing plan, but they're they're totally under the purview and control of the commission for conservation purposes. So I would assume that when we're talking about directed fisheries, we're also including recreational and subsistence fisheries and that, and that the harvest control rule applies to those fisheries too. Is that incorrect? I'm thinking carefully about the response to this, but the, the the commission has generally um, deferred to the contracting parties uh, about the control of uh, allocation, well, has always deferred about an allocation. And to some extent, that's an allocative issue. And I, I think the commission would think long and hard before, and I don't, I'm not speaking for the commission, but I, I suspect they might think long and hard before taking an action on that without reference to the contracting parties and what their, what their arrangements are domestically for sharing on that. But I, I think the, if there are conservation issues uh, at stake, I think the commission would make those statements uh, to the contracting parties. Um, I guess what I'm getting at, a long way of saying is that I don't think it's a given at what level of, of control of individual sectors uh, that the commission would, would attempt to exercise or would recommend to the two governments. Yeah, thanks. Um, th so the catch floor, that that's an objective, correct? Is that no? So is is one of the part of the harvest uh, control rule? It would rule? be part of a management procedure, part of a harvest yeah. control rule. Okay, so I think that clarifies a bit for me because I was thinking that the catch floor would be an objective as well that you want to maintain a minimum catch over a certain period of time. And if it was lower in the hierarchy than the, the second objective, that's why you wouldn't need the first one. But that makes sense to me now that if this harvest control rule is not an objective. That's why you really want the first objective as a, a final stop. Let me put it another way. If you were to tune the, the harvest control rule that included a catch floor, 
to achieve the, the probabilities that we've stated in, in objectives two and three, uh, that cash floor might be zero. Uh, you know, if the stock, if we're currently starting at such a low stock size, then the cash flow may be, you know, set as zero. Five years from now, if, if the stock rebuilds and we redo the, the MSC thing, then we may be able to increase that cash flow. But it's just, it depends on the current status of the stock as well. So let's keep that in mind. Okay, now I'm going to put Steve on the spot. Uh, and it's because I, I want we want to be able to give you some realistic expectation about what what is achievable over the near term and where we're going and what you can expect back from from our process for you to work with in there and I'm going to preface it by saying that uh, the, the task you put in front of us in terms of um, wanting to go towards a spatial component in understanding um, management of halibut is a daunting one in terms of the, the technical side of it but uh, and so it's going to be dependent on the ability of, of, of Steve and Ian uh, to sort of go through this process. But I want Steve to talk about this so we can talk, we can give you an understanding of what you can expect from us over the next six months to a year. Yeah, <clears throat> due to the savings in the government after the 16-day closure, we're now going to be able to open a daycare here at the IPHC. So. And then Low will be in charge of my kids. <laughs> he is awake. Good. Um, the I think you can all appreciate even from a, a simple model like we've done here, with it just represents essentially a coast-wide assessment, and we haven't even talked about other components of of the management procedure like the types of assessment models we might want to use, the, the, the various assumptions that we've built into these assessment models. There's a whole litany of, of things just on the stock assessment side that, that we would probably use this tool just for simulation testing purposes, but also to develop our harvest policy. And to, to jump into a fully spatial component uh, makes my head spin. So I can imagine it's also going to make your heads spin, maybe even a little faster than mine. Um, but I'm uh, very happy over the last two days uh, from of how far we've come in sort of understanding the process. And I think uh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback that, from, based on some of the questions I'm getting at the breaks, like, hey, can't we combine two rules and, and use the 30-20 rule and, and put the 15% change above 30% and do things like that? So you're getting a sense of the capabilities of being able to use this machinery uh, to address those kinds of, of procedural components. In terms of um, where to go from here, uh, what we'll be doing or what I'll be doing, I've already developed much of the uh, infrastructure in the operating model to develop all of the spatial components in terms of dimensioning the problem to deal with how that by regulatory area. The difficult problem in that particular case is how to transition from our current coast-wide assessment and then split the stock up into all of these different regulatory areas moreover split the recruitment up into these different regulatory areas and that's still some technical challenges that we're still going to take some time to sort out with our data that's available etc but the, I think in the next time we meet uh, what you'll see is something very similar to what I've shown you today with probably some more rules and, and things you can play with on the interface in terms of looking at different scenarios but it will be a coast-wide halibut assessment. Uh, it'll probably be a simple, uh, you know, production type model that we have uh, built in this particular management procedure. But we can actually explicitly address halibut issues and we can look at the current status of the stock and, and start playing with real questions. Um, I think this was a really good exercise for both me and all of us in, in looking at how important specifying these objectives, uh, the probability of achieving these objectives and the time frames that we want to achieve these objectives in. I've heard from many of you uh, that you watched uh, Doug Butterworth um, 
it's almost a for, form of torture for me listening to his voice over headphones, but I think he had some very, very valuable lessons uh, and insights in the experiences he's gone through with the International Whaling Commission and the uh, Australian, or sorry, you know, the South African rock, rock lobster fishery. They've been sustainably fishing that stock at 3% of its unfished biomass for the last 30 years, and when they tried to increase it, the courts said, no, you're not going to do that for social and economic reasons. And it would just be too financially disastrous for the fishery and the industry. So those are choices that you know have to be made. Sure, we certainly have legislation in place and, and processes that we can follow, but as Ian and I sit here and familiarize ourselves with the data and, and the history of this fishery, we recognize some assessment problems, we recognize some problems with the harvest control rule that are simply inconsistent with our current knowledge of the stock and the assessment, and as we move forward, uh, there's a lot of feedback from stakeholders about space and, and how do we deal with migration and bycatch and all of those various issues. And I think it's important that we do tackle those issues, at least to find out if they're significantly important. The timeline, I don't know if we've even talked about timelines yet, I'm not going to even bring that up right now, but that's one thing that we have to decide um, is, is how long is it going to take me to to build this model. It, I spent all summer programming the infrastructure on this thing. I haven't even sort of tested it to the point where I'm happy with it, but uh, I can say a, a year from now, we can certainly show you uh, similar situations today with a, a coast-wide model using the real halibut data, and, and I think that will be very instructive itself. Uh, perhaps a year later down the road, we'll be able to de deal with more of the spatial aspects of, of the assessment model. Um, Ian's still working on the spatial aspects of the data, uh, and until we resolve those issues, there's, we can't even move forward on, on some of the spatial issues. So that's where I'm at. Um, I'll probably be taking a little bit of time off with our, our newborn uh, when she arrives. Other than that, I'll probably be around for the interim meeting and the annual meetings. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I, I think, you know, we there may be uh, an ability to accelerate it a little bit before um, next fall for having some discussion on this thing, but I, I, I don't want to give you the expectation that, you know, three months from now we're going to be, we're going to have something in front of you that you can start to play with. I mean, we tried to stress this to begin with. This is a process, not a product. Um, and we need to have realistic timelines in this thing, and so what Steve's given you is, is a pretty realistic timeline on this, I think. So uh, we're open to comments on that, um, but we wanted to give you a pretty fair understanding of what it is. We have the, the products that we're talking about is we have the sort of investigation tools, which is what Steve has spent quite a bit of time building right now. The next step is to build the, to have the coastwide halibut model on this, and the stage after that is to have the spatially explicit model after that. So that's kind of the the uh, set of goals that we have for this and the timeline is on the order of, you know, eight months to a year to get the halibut model uh, fully functional and then probably another eight months past that mm -hmm. to get a fully, uh, fully functional spatial model on this. But again, this is, this is an ongoing process. Yeah. Just to add one more thing, uh, starting January funding, if we get the funding and everything approved for it, we'll also, I'll, We'll also be bringing in some additional help to help me with um, developing some of the operating model and spatial management procedures associated with uh, comparing things such as apportionment versus fixed allocations. I have a graduate student who's working on a project with Pacific Hake, and it's a nice contrast comparison. I also have a, another postdoc visiting from uh, the Farsi's lab in Japan who's going to come over here for a few months and uh, help us again continue to work on developing the operating model um, and jointly. A lot of the tuna commissions have already sort of picked up many of the tools that we've developed here at the, the Halibut Commission, so there's been a huge demand on my time to go to different countries, and I've graciously said no to all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, per. Uh, yeah, Per Odegaard. Uh, yeah, I understand it's a process, and sort of takes some time, but is there anything we can uh, bring to the next annual meeting? Uh, no, actually I was very clear on that in our first go around that nothing we're doing in here is going to influence 2014 management issues. Okay.
Okay. Um, sorry, Adam and Paul. Thank you. Um, so maybe just to repeat, what I'm hearing is that until fall 2014. Uh, Stevie wouldn't have an operating model that would be coast-wide, and then roughly another eight months to a year, that model would contain some spatial elements to, to it, so mm -hmm. 2015. Um, could you just tell, do you have an idea at this point in time, when, you're, when you say spatial, are you meaning by existing management areas or something um, other? And um, you mentioned as well uh, that uh, finding funding for um, exploring apportionment versus some uh, fixed harvest rates. Uh, is, so what's that con uh, contingent, contingent upon? Can I answer the second one first? Um, in our budgeting, Paul, we'll be um, asking for funding for to fund this grad student to come in here for six months. The Japanese visiting fellow is going to come in at no cost to us, but we are looking for some funding uh, as at, in our upcoming budget, that'll be a line item in our budget looking for that. So. Yeah, just to fill in on the, the second part, she's a, one of my graduate students who has a, a huge amount of expertise in, in uh, man, management strategy evaluation and, and, and doing these, this sort of work. Uh, she started on the East Coast and joined my lab at UBC the same day that I accepted the position here at the IPHC. <laughs> um, but she's uh, been busy with working with Murdoch McAllister and, and uh, Nathan Taylor, uh, Robin Forrest over in, in Nanaimo uh, on the Pacific Hate stuff. So I'm pretty excited to have her come down and work uh, side by side with her for a little while. Um, regarding the, the first question, we already have the, the spatial models built and running. They're not on our raster type grid where you're looking at cell by cell uh, areas. We're actually using the polygon type representation where each regulatory area qualifies as a spatial unit. Uh, the reason we chose that structure is A, it, it speeds up the calculations and the operations um, at, at a much faster rate. There's a lot less data uh, input that goes into it. And then we also don't have to worry about any data confidentiality type issues. If there's some halibut fisherman in 2B that's no one else fishes there, we, we have to be very careful of how we use those data. The um, other reason for, for doing the polygon type structure is, is that we have from our pit tagging studies fairly decent estimates of what we think the migration rates uh, among the regulatory areas are. Uh, by size and by age, so we can play around with those parameters. Otherwise, we'd just be setting up naive diffusion, advection diffusion type models and, and really have no data to parameterize those, those types of models. So um, that was my choice. Uh, it does limit some of the potential questions with regards to spatial management within a regulatory area. Um, so if those become high priority things, uh, my salary is going to have to go way up. Um, just a follow-up question then. Uh, so if what would you see, I guess, Bruce, happening between now and fall of 2014? In terms of any advice going towards the commission, you mean? No, I, I think we've been clear. Well, you've been clear on that, and uh, I think that's what we want to continue. I'm not recommending any or asking them for any change on that. I guess what I was asking is, okay, um, what I was hearing, well, it's on the slide. Is it that slide? Yeah. So um, there will be some work. Would there be work now then exploring what the existing harvest rules are? Um, or is that going to wait until the, uh, the model in 2000, fall of 2014? We're, we're going to punt this over to Ian and see what he says. <laughs> So uh, yes, I guess the, the short answer is yes. The, I, I'm a, quite a bit of the analysis I've done this year does give us additional insight into the current harvest control rule and our perspective on where the stock's been over the historical record. That said, um, neither Steve nor I has tackled 
trying to create a revised harvest policy. I think that would be premature at this point. And it's something that we haven't entirely sorted out how the process of developing a harvest policy, whether we would need some sort of an interim policy to fill in between now and the time that we generated enough results out of this process to feel like we had some candidate policies in place. Um, I think the best I can offer in the, in the short term is to better understand the properties of the data and the assessment model and the current harvest policy um, and at least, at least shed some light on, on its performance over the historical time period. Okay, thanks Ian. Um, so then what would you see this particular group here, the MSAB, doing between now and the fall? I mean, I think um, there's still some more work to do around objectives. I don't think we've nailed that down, but what other work? Um, go ahead, Steve. Um, I think we, we certainly need to decide when we want to reconvene, if we want to do another June meeting n next year. Um, but outreach to your stakeholders and participants is, is uh, you know, and, and certainly updating them after we've compiled our meeting report. I think is important. Uh, I think you've had a bit of a preview of uh, what we can do uh, through this process, uh, and then if we do have a, a meeting in June, you know, with, to convert what I have here now, putting the halibut data in, is wouldn't take me long. We could probably do this in December. Oh, I'm having a baby. Sorry, we can't do that in December, but we um, could do it in pretty short order. Uh, going to a more size, age structured uh, assessment is going to st still take some more time in terms of, of my time and, and help with others that are joining us. Uh, feedback on the objectives, performance measures is probably one of the good things. And I think the one that you're probably going to get a lot of questions uh, from the stakeholders, for those of you who remember transitioning from 2006 to 2007, I certainly remember it, and I'm not even a quota holder. Uh, there was uh, some pretty huge pains in some areas and some gains in other areas, and if we do, uh, you may want to engage the, your stakeholders and, and have discussions with your stakeholders about how we may transition to a, a new procedure once we go through this process. And the process might be that we go through the process and decide to keep the current procedure and status quo and it does satisfy the objectives and that's fine uh, and we'll probably within a year or so also be updating our harvest procedures and make sure it's consistent with the current stock assessment models that we're producing results with so that would be the conversation I'd have with your stakeholders um, I'd encourage you if, if you are having meetings uh, with your members and, and you want to demonstrate some of the tools we're developing there uh, give me a phone call. I can come up, in, up up to Vancouver fairly easy, have a Skype phone call with you guys or whatever, and, and put together something to, to, for a show-and-tell type story. Does that answer your question, Paul? You looking for more specifics? <laughs> no, that, that was uh, really helpful, um, at least for me. I guess... Um, I guess I was a little bit taken by surprise, a little bit, about the timing, that's all. And uh, so things change, that's fine. Um, and then I was wondering, too, I guess, uh, so in the afternoon we're talking about, uh, or maybe we're going to segue into that now before lunch, but talking about uh, communications to the public, the commission, and et cetera. So I don't know if you want to leave that to the afternoon, but I had some thoughts on that, too, given just what we talked about now. Um, we can, uh, I think, probably lunch is available right now. Maybe we could take that up right after lunch, Paul. Sure. That works right. Okay. Could you just check and see if lunch is available there? Um, I, I, you know, the, uh, the idea of the time frame, I, I think Paul is reasonable, but I have to look at this too and say, you know, what else have we got, you know, Steve involved in, which is significantly some other stuff too. He's uh, taken the lead on uh, looking at the size and age issue, which is a very significant one for us and trying to understand that process. So he's the lead on our, on our major project we're doing with NPRB as well as uh, working with Ian on assessment-based issues in there as well. So um, 
it's just trying to budget the time uh, for projects and prioritizing within there. And so we can have that discussion at the, the commission level as well. Okay, I think we'll uh, break for lunch right now. Uh, if we can take, uh, are we up? Okay, okay, so we got about five minutes, but we'll uh, break for 45 minutes and come back at uh, 12.30. You have five minutes? Oh, Spore's not here. I was going to do some more abuse on it. Chris. I ran a relaxed spore procedure where you allowed the, the catch rates to change by 25% for each year. I was going to share that on screen, except I just unjoined the webinar. Yeah. Just in time for some abuse, Chris. Yeah, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. screen. Okay. So you remember earlier we had the uh, spore procedure. We were comparing that to the 30-20 rule. And we saw that the biomasses, sorry, let me look at the screen, um, were always higher under the, the spore procedure, uh, which was a 15% adjustment in the catch each year. And so you saw in the catches you, these sawtooth patterns that were they would either increase or de decrease by 15% per year, whereas the 30-20 rule shuts things off. So I'm going to hide the 30-20 rule now. And then some of you say, well, I'm willing to accept a little bit more variability uh, because I want to have a higher catch. Uh, I didn't do it asymmetric because when you brought the asymmetric slow up fast down rule, this thing was already running, so I didn't bother going back to it. Um, but I did do a fixed harvest rate with a 25% adjustment. And basically what you see is, is the two procedures appear to perform uh, pretty similar across all four scenarios. You do get slightly more variability in the fixed harvest rate with a 25% adjustment. Um, the real action over here is in the tables. If we're just comparing the, the spore procedure and the relaxed spore procedure. Uh, you get the same depletion level overall. You get the same harvest rates, sorry, median catch values are, are roughly the same. The five-year annual catch variation, of course, is going to be larger when you allow that, that thing to change by as much as 25% per year. So you see more variability in catch. Um, you never close the fishery. And then uh, the probability of falling below the spawning stock objective, of, uh, sorry, the spawning biomass limit is pretty low. And then uh, there's about a 10% chance of falling below the uh, 30% limit. If you compare that back to our 30-20 rule, we had a 30% chance of falling below 
SB30. Once it gets there, of course my mouse is right in the way. There's about a 31% chance you fall below the uh, spawning biomass limit. So if, if our objective was to keep that thing below 25, we wouldn't choose that procedure. We'd choose the either the spore or the relaxed spore procedure. So just allowing the catch to vary a little bit more um, it doesn't really give you a whole lot more catch. It increases your variance slightly. All the other performance metrics seems to appear okay. Where you really see the um, action is is really in the initial year of implementation. You'll either go up, you'll either take a 15% cut the first year or a 25% cut the first year. So this is when I when I talk about talking to your constituents about transitions. Uh, you know the sablefish example was a hard pill to swallow. They didn't want to take that full step down to 1,200 tons and, and they only came down to 2,400 tons and I think it's now what down to two 2,000 tons now, 2,200 tons. So that's going to be one of the, the more difficult uh, parts to accept, just like it was difficult to accept last year that all of a sudden a new stock assessment model says the whole stock is 30% smaller than we thought it was in the previous year. So this is going to be no different. When you change the way of doing business, it may come at a cost, a short-term cost, but hopefully a longer-term gain depending on where you are. Okay? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, we, we got we got that. Okay, what I'd like to talk about this afternoon is um, communicating the results uh, back to both uh, the public, to the commissioners, and, and feedback mechanisms. Um, our current um, thoughts on this, uh, just in terms of uh, communications right now, is that we would produce fairly rapidly a two-page summary of the meeting that would go up on our, on our website, uh, and then we'd have a more detailed uh, set of notes that would be going out for you for review before it was made available. That would also go on the website. The both re reports of both meetings will be in our rah-rah this year. 
Um, so they'll be out there. And then at both the interim meeting and the annual meeting, the MSAB will be an agenda item uh, for our discussions with the commissioners on this. But uh, that's just sort of what our framework is right now, and I'm totally open to uh, your comments on both not only communicating outwards, but also getting uh, stakeholder feedback in this, which is more along the lines of your jobs uh, as we perceive it anyway. So, Dan. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, Dan Hall, and I thought about uh, Steve, before we broke for lunch, he, he offered to, you know, to either be on, the, on Skype or come visit people to go through this, uh, the flight simulator and, and to help instruct. And, and I thought it might be helpful um, to do something like that as maybe during the evening of one of our council meetings. And, and as a way to perhaps, not just for the flight simulator, but perhaps even describing the MSC process for, for stakeholders um, and then members of uh, MSAB who are at the council meetings can be there as well to, to listen in and to and, and that way I, I think that's the kind of um, one way, one process that um, I know I and other MSAB members that are in the council process could get um, input from stakeholders as a group instead of just as one-on-one -on -one or individual meetings or phone calls or email messages it provides a, 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 a discussion for for that so I would make that suggestion and and, and maybe it would be you know I don't know if uh, probably this December council meeting is not a I don't know if it would or would not be a good time it I think it would be af after the report from this meeting comes out from our, our, our meeting here Maybe it would be in February after the IPHC meeting. I'm not sure. When, I think but. probably December is a good one because Ian and I have talked about coming up and doing an evening session on the assessment uh, during well, during good. the December meeting as that'd well. So it might it might be we could do that maybe over a couple of nights or just in one long session that that, that evening. Uh, we could probably twin those together over a couple of hours. Would probably work. It, I just think it would it would save a lot a uh, lot of time um, instead of contacting groups individually. I think you did it as in one. One big party. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that. It's a good suggestion. Yeah. So, Paul. Hey, uh, uh, Paul speaking. Um, on the communication, uh, Bruce, I like the idea of your uh, two pager of providing a you know uh, a succinct summary of what the uh, the meeting entailed and uh, having that for public uh, availability. I was also wondering, and uh, maybe Steve has already done this, is about a probably a, a document, uh, one to five pages, that would explain about his flight simulator, what it is, and <clears throat> what's uh, included in that, um, so that we have a better appreciation. Um, we heard a lot about it today, but having a docu that documentation would be, I think, uh, really a big, big help. Um, the SharePoint Drive documents, who's that open to right now? The uh, SharePoint site has two components I believe one is one is an internal one and one is a public one right now um, the public gets to see all the documents Steve Can I, I'll ask Steve Dan. the public site has the reports of the meetings posted as well as the presentations and any other basically anything else you would like to be posted for the public the the internal SharePoint site has all the documents that are available to you before the meeting and is a workspace for you to use. Same as, it's similar to the commissioners. Okay. So um, just a, a comment on the, on the SharePoint. I find it very useful um, once I figured out how to access it. And um, so having all those documents in one place is a, a big plus uh, to me. And being able to go on and find without having to look around for that thing is a, a great tool to have. Um, I wonder uh, around the communication uh, piece, were you thinking, Bruce, of identifying someone on your staff, or uh, that would be the communication lead, or um, in terms of a dedicated person to MSAB communications? <laughs> um, whether it was MSAB or just communications generally, I guess, and um, so. But if, would there be someone uh, on the MSAB as the communication person? 
Not as not as specifically identified as one no. We're not quite that deep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was one. Um, I did have a, some discussion before coming down here with uh, our communication branch, and so we have staff that I mean that's what their job is, and would offer that to you. Um, Allison Webb is the current director of of the communication branch, and uh, her staff have a whole bunch of experience in drafting documents for the public. Um, they provide a great deal of assistance to me uh, in various forms for uh, putting all that stuff together. That would translate documents that are hard to understand for a public with dealing with really technical details and translates it into here's what's going on and it's worked uh, well for us and so we'd provide that offer to you or if you wanted to follow up we could set up a um, discussion with Allison and she could better explain what sort of um, things she could uh, provide. Thanks for that, Paul. Yeah. Other thoughts? Peggy. Well, Peggy Parker with Hannah. Um, stupid question number 8,000. Uh, is the flight simulator available through those SharePoint sites or do we need to uh, input the URL to get there? Okay. The website address that's on the board is uh, was just temporarily put up in place um, by Jay yesterday morning, and he asked about the public availability. I have no problems sharing anything. There's nothing proprietary on there. So it'll eventually get changed to probably something like IPFC Shiny. Uh, MSE whatever um, app and then we can put that link on the MSAB website. Dan, I'm sorry, Peggy. Go ahead, no, go ahead. This is Peggy again at Hannah. Um, I'm thinking about ways to get the, the word out to our constituents and um, I'm loath to ask anything that's going to burden the staff anymore, so don't read that into this, but um, I'm sort of thinking out loud. What I, what I had been thinking many times over the last two days that would be helpful for me is to see ways, first of all, is to understand the current process and then see um, how we're, or why we're thinking about running um, evaluative um, procedures on that. So just to give some of my members a clear, bright example of where things don't really work in the current iteration of things. And you guys have probably um, maybe unintentionally given me some, some examples of that. Um, Dr. Martel did just recently when he said that the harvest control rule is inconsistent with some current data that we're, uh, we have been using for a while. So um, I guess I'm just saying out loud that what I'd like to do, and, and there are ways that I can, there are uh, documents I know I can look at, like the Blue Book, for instance, over the past few years to find these examples. But um, I may send you an email with certain specific questions okay. about how to delineate that so that when people say, why the heck are you guys even doing this, we can say this is what we want to um, this is the reason that we're doing this, is this doesn't fit as well as we think it might. We can do that. Yes, Scott. Uh, Scott Mazzoni, along the lines of getting the word out to people, I was hoping perhaps the first or second day of the annual meeting, while you have a whole group together, perhaps give an overview and update of the whole MSAB process, and then list our names so that if anyone has further questions, they don't come bugging you, they come <laughs> talk to us. And I also agree that the website is an excellent idea. I'm, I'm finding a lot of help from that. Thank you. I'll be happy to make Chris Spore very famous at the end of the I think we, uh, that, that is the plan. We will probably have a report on the MSAB as part of our public session, one of our public session presentations. Uh, it's, it's 
that kind of profile that I think we should be carrying this, this forward on there. And your names, of course, are already listed, and we'll be happy to put it up on our, our bulletin board at the uh, sort of navigating the annual meeting. Oh, by the way, you might want to talk to these folks here about MSAB. And, and as you recall, we have on the SharePoint, actually on the main uh, web page for us, we've created intermediary emails for you folks, which are just iphc.info that gets forwarded to your personal email and you can choose to respond or not according to your personal email or through the website because we felt you deserved some protection uh, from sort of, you know, people decide they might want to email you in the middle of the night or something. So. Protection? I want a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts on communication, particularly on stakeholder outreach and such. Uh, to give you a, a feeling for what uh, we had had planned, Dan, I think it's a good idea to, because Ian and I were planning to come up and talk about assessments, so putting the MSAB in there, we are meeting with uh, Hannah, uh, which we'll probably discuss part of these issues with Hannah. We usually have a meeting with HAB in December. Adam, do you know when the meeting is in December yet? Second week, tenth week. Okay. Okay. And Hannah is the eighteenth. Yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of fun stuff here. <laughs> FEOA folks, yes, often often come over to the office sometimes. Okay, if there's no other thoughts on uh, communication outreach on this, um, I'd just kind of like to try and uh, wrap this up and make sure that we're all on the same page and where we're going in this. We've identified um, the objectives that we're going to be investigating through this. Um, I want to stress again that um, when we're talking this morning about delivery of uh, the next product to you, what we want to put in front of you is a realistic coastwide population model. As Steve indicated, we could do something interim in there, but I don't think that would be very satisfying because we'd have to have so many caveats on how applicable the application of the controllers and stuff are, is that what we want to put in front of you the next time you have something in front of you is a realistic coast-wide model of the halibut stock so you can start to work with these things on there. Um, we will try to get that um, done as soon as we can, but realistically we're probably looking at late summer to early fall to actually have that in place because of the, the complexity of even a coast-wide model. It's not trivial. Plus we also, um, Ian and Steve want to work together uh, on this process because the, the background model should be able to mimic many things that we're going to be feeding into the assessment as well. So that's, uh, we want to have some coherence between those, those uh, two models. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Steve? <coughs> <laughs> Thoughts you want to share on that? <laughs> Didn't have much more on our agenda. We had a session on discussion, feedback, and closing remarks. and. Uh, I think this has been an extremely useful uh, meeting. I thought uh, yesterday morning's discussion and yesterday afternoon's discussions, although a bit rambling, were extremely useful at, at helping us uh, focus on some of the, uh, the issues that we're going to have to work on in the interim between the next time we talk to you folks. Um, and I would invite you all, uh, of course, to you know, contact us directly if you have some additional things that uh, are sort of burning in your minds that you want to have us think about. And, building uh, these tools for you to look at. Uh, so by all means, give us a call if you have. But I'm floor is open for sort of discussion remarks or any kind of concluding remarks on this. I just, sorry, I wanted to reiterate that um, if Hannah or Hab or anything is, is having a meeting and, and they'd like me to come up 
and um, give a demonstration of, of where we're going with this software and these tools. I, I do live with my mother-in-law, so I'm very happy to leave town and entertain those ideas. Yeah, Scott Meyer. So just a quick question about the, the shiny, the flight simulator. Um, when you're simulating catch there, that's all the tar all the removals. You're not okay. So it includes things that maybe the commission that, that aren't covered under allocations right now. It's yeah, the, yeah. There was two scenarios there. One where we had a full comprehensive catch accounting system and another one that was poorly labeled theft, which had a, basically a, a leaky sieve. There's some missing catch documentation. So we're simulating that, uh, but the assessment model doesn't think it exists. So that's, that's what's going on there. That's why the stock continues to go down, but it doesn't crash right away because the harvest control rules we're always using have a feedback control linked to biomass. If you, if you had a, a system like that where there was missing fish or, or made a wrong assumption and you, you put in a, a policy that was, say, a constant catch where it didn't vary with biomass, the stock would go extinct. Just to, to clarify, I guess, I, w I wasn't thinking so much about unaccounted for removals as I was uh, anticipating, I guess, based on conversations with I had with Ian before that um, that when we finally do, as this simulation, as the operating model moves along, that that you'll probably be accounting for those unallocated removals. They'll be like coming off the top. So there are things that are accounted for, subsistence, unguided sport, but they're not part of the catch limit per se. Right, there'll be like a fixed removal that exactly that comes off the top, but, but for now, those fixed removals aren't in there. Yeah, okay. Uh, Paul Ryle. Um, so, I think this has been a, a really big step forward over the first meeting, in my view. I think we were kind of floundering a little bit in the first meeting, and I think there's been significant progress made in uh, thinking about these concepts and uh, coming up with uh, potential objectives. And I deliberately use the word potential and uh, because I think we're still exploring what these objectives are. And I guess thinking about reporting out at the uh, interim meeting, I believe it's on the agenda for the interim meeting. And uh, I was wondering, if, if Bruce, if you had any thoughts of how you would report out, probably along the lines of a report on the two meetings, uh, probably with some context around where we got to, and uh, and uh, and then probably next steps. Um, I was wondering, I guess, about the next steps, given that I think this group has, you know come together, um, have a much better appreciation of uh, all the challenges of managing halibut and, uh, and also some of our lack of understanding and technical capabilities. And then um, given I think we've made this progress and we probably won't have a model let's say until the fall of 2014, um, I guess one of the things that goes through my mind is about momentum and keeping this project uh, moving along. I think uh, when we go back home, um, I think there will be some interest in taking up uh, Steve's generous offer to uh, come and explain uh, the flight simulator and address questions. I think that will help keep, um, you know, uh, questions uh, about what the project is and also uh, allay any fears that something's going to happen in 2014 because I think some people's minds that's probably still there. But um, having said that, it'll address a number of questions and uh, really help uh, us uh, on this group here think about how we want to move forward. So I think there probably will be some interest in that, uh, whether it's at the HAB meeting or others. Um, I think there will certainly be some. And then um, 
what I was wondering, I guess, where to go to from there here with this particular group, because um, I was thinking that one step that we probably would do back home is start thinking about more concrete objectives and words around those objectives um, based upon, you know, uh, where we've got to today. So a long-winded way of getting to, I think there should, would be value in having another meeting of this group. Uh, we would get some direction back from the commission um, and that would help uh, set the, you know, probably a timeline for when this group would get back together and what it would talk about. So I just put that out there as just for get the comment as well from the group. Comments? Um, I share your concern about the uh, momentum and, and uh, you know, I want to continue to keep the enthusiasm of this group going because it really, it, it is your input that makes this process happen. Um, I guess what we probably should have is a discussion about when we want to reconvene and then uh, I have to plan and, and my time and my budget about how I can take the next step forward. The easiest, the low-hanging fruit for me right now is to take the current uh, infrastructure that we built for this toy model and adapt it to the halibut situation. That's probably um, something that could be done fairly quickly. The uh, My only concern is that I would probably want a considerable amount of time to play with it, make sure it's consistent with uh, the results that Ian's getting out of the assessments and, and things like that because once we go uh, into that realm, then I feel like we're having a, a very um, a conversation that we have to have, but I'm not so sure that I'm ready to have that conversation. And and if and I feel more comfortable sharing it with this group first before I run off and and show it to DFO and 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 have and Hannah and stuff like that. I, I certainly want you guys to see it first. We also have a uh, scientific review board that's pretty overburdened right now, trying to play catch up with 100 years of history in, in three weeks. Uh, who, who would I'd also like to vet this through? And Jimmy and Elias and Sean are both on that review board, and I do work closely with the two of them on many different projects. So uh, I think we could probably reschedule a meeting fairly soon. Um, and, and take that first step, Paul, where we take this current infrastructure, adapt it to the real halibut data. It would be a limited set of the halibut data, but at least we can start to explore some halibut issues. I think what you're going to see is very different results in the policies you choose just because of the current state of the halibut stock as we know it. Um, final comment is that I would like everybody in this room to actually see uh, the results of this year's assessments and, and the updates uh, because I think that's also looking further back in the past is going to give you a little more perspective on our objectives and where we want to be as well. So Ian, I'm sure, can comment us on that regard. Stay tuned. I've got lots of stuff to present this fall. And Ian, what what is that going to be? You were talking about your you said you were sending some additional items about the PDO, and uh, so is this going to be something new, different? And when are you going to present those? Inter meeting before the inter meeting? So what I've been working on this year was primarily a focus on the data and reconstructing the data sets back through the historical record, um, and I presented that information to the scientific review board a couple of weeks ago, um, and there'll be a report in this year's RARA summarizing the basically all the various data sources that we have at, at hand, um, how they get constructed, where they come from, and what are some of the important trends to, to pick up in them. I also I have done a fair bit of modeling uh, using those data and also using the, the just the more recent data. Um, and I, I discussed a number of different things with the Scientific Review Board of ways to present that information. Um, 
I don't want to scare anybody. I'm not. I'm not going to be coming in with some brand new model that gives some totally different answer. You know, not that that's ever happened before. But um, <clears throat> really, my my efforts in modeling this year have been to provide some better context for the estimates that we do have. And so you'll see a very similar um, set of results to previous processes in that I'm going to have um, several analyses that I present just like I did last year with various levels of natural mortality, perhaps a bit broader spectrum looking at different data sources and, and ways to use them. Um, and I'm still going to be packaging the results into the decision table, perhaps with some improved columns. But really, if, if you weren't interested in the details, you could, you could step back and the, the format should look very similar to, to previous years. Thanks, Ian. Steve. As we said originally on this, um, we really want to put something in front of you that's going to be most relevant to the decision making about managing the halibut stock. So again, while we might be able to do something on an interim basis, I would advise not to do that. I think we should focus our attention on, on uh, the things that are most realistic to decision making on us. Is there an appetite for um, a meeting in late spring? And if so, uh, given the fact that we may not have a, a fully functional model at uh, that stage, what would be the, the topic of that if, if there was a desire to have that? Yeah, Per Odegaard. Yeah, uh, meeting in late spring will be just fine. Uh, give us what you have. I mean, you know, if, it, if we go a day, then maybe it's not a two-day deal if, if that's all the information you have. It, it you know, keeps us kind of tuned up, so to speak. I, th I think that was one of Steve's comments, too, about trying to keep momentum on things. I'm, I'm just sensitive to how valuable those discussions would be in that. And, and maybe, as Paul, you said, over this time period, we've perhaps been able to have a different level of examination of, of the objectives that we've identified and here we're going to be looking at and, and that's certainly we could have that discussion at a meeting like that. Bruce. Yeah, I'm Bruce Gabris. If we had a spring meeting, spring for me defined as May would be much better than June. Um, so if that's, if that's um, how about after April 15th? <laughs> but. Yeah, anytime after April 15th or May would be great for me. June is starting to get kind of into the heat of things. Yeah, uh, Dan Hall, just thinking out loud about what might happen between now and the spring, I, um, I sense that, that um, there are a number of MSAB members who might, after this meeting, think of other management objectives or, or um, performance measures and, and things to submit. Um, that might change how we all view what we're doing. In addition, we'll have the new stock assessment, and, that, and after the annual meeting, that that may or may not also uh, change our views of the process. So, um, or not necessarily the process, but um, the the importance and, and how how fast we move and what's what's significant about it. So, um, for for those reasons, a, a spring meeting might make some sense. I, I am I'm sensitive to the uh, idea of, or, or the need to do something or, or to have a meeting that would be important to have and not just to have it for the sake of having it. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, um, Dan, I'd agree with that. And uh, the other thought that came to mind is that it was pretty tough since our last meeting to get people's attention. You know, I didn't have everybody running up to me and says, "What happened on the MSAB board?" I was soliciting them, and there. But I, but I do believe that after we get the new stock assessment and after this next annual meeting, uh, this is a time of year coming into the winter time, and I, at least personally, I have the best opportunity to contact a lot of individuals and groups because this is the meeting cycle for a lot of that, and uh, uh, what I would have a lot better input and data and, and more to share now with those individuals. And if we were to meet in spring, I think you'd find, the, uh, at least from my perspective, that would have a lot more, uh, perhaps more useful uh, constituent data, if you will, um, at, and when we do come to spring. 
Okay. Thank you for the thoughts. I think those are uh, are fairly compelling reasons to be talking, particularly in the, in the sense of having the results of the updated assessment and may give people uh, an altered perspective or an enhanced perspective on, on what you might want to be looking at and um, revisiting in your own mind some of the objectives is, is probably reasonable. So um, I'm certainly willing to schedule something in, say, the April period, uh, if that's kind of a month when people would be willing to do that. You're seeing nods around the table. Any any sort of screaming blue meanies about April? <laughs> Second half of April, <laughs> late April. Okay. Yes, Peggy. Peggy and Hannah. Then that would mean we'd have another meeting once the model is up and running. Later, yes. Later in yes, August, September. That's October. correct. We would have a list of uh, late late summer, early fall. I would think something like that, Steve. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else? Hearts and flowers. You know. <laughs> um, I I realize this is uh, time out of your schedules. Uh, it was I think a very good meeting for us in terms of the input that we needed to get from you and helping us move forward there. But uh, this has been very valuable, and I appreciate all the time and the uh, input that you've had for us over this last couple of days. So thank you all very much for that. Yeah. Okay. And we're off. <laughs>